master class and we have interesting line up about the cases before we go on to the cases speaker and moderator i will like to inform all the participants that we have migrated from one master class every week with one speaker to three uh, speakers and every three weekly we will have this master class so that those who wants to have mmc credit points of cme can get it in addition i will like to inform at uttar uh, cc children's hospital managed by narayan health we have working schedule is almost normalized like pre covid time we have operating rooms functioning like pre covid time and many of you may have visited srcc children's hospital but those who have not visited we will welcome you all to visit the hospital but if i had to say in nutshell about the infrastructure at the srcc hospital we have all the corridors are special the walls are special there are curtains between the beds so that if you want to have sort of isolation in a covid time even each and every bed is isolated and you have what we call physical distancing if it is required it is all there uh, we take utmost care to make sure that everybody is safe and uh, in case if you or your any patients needs any any children needs any health care do remember srcc children's hospital with this few words i will request our moderator of today's session dr avisha who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and doing very good uh, work in pediatric orthopedic surgery as well as dr pooja mehta she is a pediatric neurologist at srcc children's hospital i request both the moderator to take over before that another thing which i like to inform that today's master class will be about for two and half three hours with three speakers but we will divide this videos on youtube under the name of three speakers which may take a day or so so next time if you want to access this videos or cme you can directly go to the uh, talk with the name of the person and the youtube channel will be of narayan health uh, thank you once again for joining today i request avisha and pooja mehta to take over please Uh, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction and welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. So we have a stellar cast uh, today with some amazing uh, lectures. So just some housekeeping rules uh, during the entire process. If uh, everyone can uh, mute their mic as uh, as well as if you want, they can switch off uh, their uh, cameras so that they can see the screen well. Uh, so that uh, the uh, speakers are not disturbed while the talks are going on. uh hopefully my co moderator will join in soon so till then i'll just uh, introduce our uh, amazing faculty for today we have uh, dr sumit pawar who is a very experienced uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgeon he is one of the very few uh, um, uh, one of the very few who does minimal access uh, endoscopic uh, surgery for pediatrics and uh, there are very few in the country who uh, do these procedures and he is going to be speaking on management of uh, head injury with us then we also have uh, dr vibhor borkar he is a very experienced uh, pediatric uh, gastroenterologist and hepatologist and he has a lot of experience in uh, treating uh, gi disorders liver disorders and also uh, endoscopy and nutritional disorders in children so he is going to be speaking to us on an uh, interesting topic that is approach to uh, jaundice in children then we also have uh another uh, uh, great faculty from our uh, team that is uh, dr ruchi parekh she is a very experienced uh, pediatric endocrinologist and also has a great interest in uh, uh, pediatric obesity and she is also one of the leading figures of our pediatric clinic we run in uh, srcc children's hospital and she uh, uh, treats most of our osteogenesis imperfecta and other skeletal dysplasia patients uh, usually is seen by her and today she is going to be talking to us about a speaker what is normal and what is abnormal so we have 3 uh, hours of amazing talks uh, lined up so uh, let's start uh, with our first speaker if uh, doc if doctors 
uh, Sumit Pawar can uh, uh, unmute and share his screen. Uh, before you start, uh, who is going first, Vibor or Sumit? Vibor. Okay, uh, sorry Vibor about that. First. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, <laughs> if Dr. Vibor can uh, share his screen and uh, let's see how do we approach to join this. Yeah, before Vibor starts, I request admin people, please mute everybody except the speaker and uh, uh, adjust the mm -hmm. setting in a way that they can't unmute on, or, on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Arnab, please go click on participant and click uh, in a, in more. You will find that button that. Uh, yes, doctor, we are doing that. The system, jo hamara system hai na, it's on hold, so that's why. But it's taking some time. Wo kar hai hum log, sir. Okay. Okay. Fine. Please take over. We both. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Doctor Ravi, for the kind introduction. So without wasting much time, let's proceed uh, with uh, today's uh, talk. So I'll be, uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. we can. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, 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 I'm an audible also, right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. So we'll be discussing about how to approach a child with the jaundice uh, in our OPD. We know that it's uh, many children do get uh, they present with either some non-specific symptoms and parents sometimes either we detect jaundice or sometimes parents uh, come, uh, come <clears throat> detect jaundice. So we will be discussing it through a series of cases. So here, uh, let's see the first case. Here we have a six years old boy who presented with a five days history of prodrome, which consists of nausea, vomiting and fever. After that, this child complaining of an upper abdominal pain, which was quite non-specific, was disturbing his sleep. And then the doctor noticed that he has a jaundice. So they did his liver function test that shows a mild jaundice. If you see, it's, a, it's a just 2.5 uh, and the conjugated fraction was less. And uh, if you see the SGOT, that was very high. That was 1,768. With this jaundice lasted for six days and later on jaundice increased uh, to a predominantly a conjugated fraction. Enzymes decrease a little bit. And here uh, the, we did an INR, which was with, after vitamin K and it was 1.2. Um, if we said an examination wise, this child weight and height were age appropriate. His development was normal. On examination, he had an hepatomegaly, which was five centimeter tender, just a regular margin, and it was soft to firm in consistency. When we did an etiological workup, this child has hepatitis A, IgM positive. On follow-up, in a one month follow-up, his liver function test normalized and child was clinically normal. So this picture is quite clear. We know we are dealing with an acute viral hepatitis. Classical presentation, it goes through various stages from stage one to stage three. The stage one is typical prodrome where we get anorexia, fever, vomiting, and upper abdominal pain, which is followed by jaundice and dark urine. And in and the later stage, the fever generally after the onset of the jaundice, fever decreases, his appetite improves, the general condition of the child improves. An examination generally we get in hepatomegaly, your spleen may or may not be palpable. So, and your amino trans, uh, his uh, amino tra uh, transfer is this means AS SGOT, SGPT is quite high, more than actually the, the amount of bilirubin that goes high. And synthetic function, which we measured by prothrombin time or INR, which is generally normal. And this is uh, typical of a, uh, what we call as an icteric hepatitis, but that is only 20 to 30%. Majority of them have an icteric hepatitis. They can have a similar picture of liver inflammation without significant jaundice. Most common etiology in children in our scenario, the older children are hepatitis A, hepatitis E, sometimes uh, B, and rarely C. Younger the kids, we need to look for other viral infections like CMV infections, EBV infections, sometimes parvovirus B infection. So once such child come to us in OPD, what should we do? What should we look for? First thing we look for, are we dealing with any complications? So we assess for any encephalopathy and liver size. 
younger the child diagnosing encephalopathy is very very difficult so any child whose behavior is a little bit abnormal than his uh, routine behavior suppose the child is more irritable not eating well is sleeping a lot so that is these are the subtle signs where probably child is doing encephalo you know, going towards encephalopathy in doctor's chamber most of the children are irritable so that assessment sometimes is difficult to make it so ask children what happens when he is at home then if we detect jaundice or if jaundice is present on the blood test then we do a complete liver function test at least once we should do a liver function test once their jaundice is present then we can see how much or how to tailor made this liver function test and if your jaundice is more than 5 as you see this case the first jaundice was less and then it increased to more than 5 then we look for a synthetic function do a inr and document that the child has a normal uh, inr monitor his liver size clinically Sudden decrease in the liver side, then we are worried. A significantly increased spleen. Probably we might be dealing with the chronic liver disease. Watch for, as we discuss, for early signs of encephalopathy. So, uh, in this child, uh, if you see the liver functions were like this. So, what do uh, this test tell us? His bilirubin was seven, SGOT and SGPT was um, more than ten times elevated. Albumin was normal. So, if we want to approach a jaundice, first we see if the jaundice is conjugated or unconjugated. History-wise, we ask for a urine color. If urine color is normal, we are dealing with an unconjugated jaundice. This VDs are totally different. Here we are dealing with a with yellow urine, so it's a conjugated jaundice. If other liver function tests are abnormal, probably probably I'm doing dealing with hepatobiliary disorders. If if only isolated bilirubin is increased, then probably genetic disorder. They are quite rare. Let's not discuss this here. When there are a hepatobiliary disease, either it can be a disease which is limited to the liver, or there is some pathology which is affecting the bile ducts. And if it is a uh, jaundice which is within the liver, either it is because of some issues at the cellular level, hepatocyte level, or there will be problem with the small bile duct that we call as a cholestatic disorder. Let's see how to see how to go ahead with this case and try to see where the exactly problem is going on. So what liver function tells us is basically liver function test is a battery of tests and it tells us about the pattern of disease. It doesn't tell us the diagnosis. It tells you what we are dealing with. So typical liver function test, if you see, uh, like in uh, in the index case, AST, ALT, or SGOT, SGPT are very high. Alkaline phosphatase and GGT is not much elevated. Bilirubin may or may not be elevated with normal synthetic function. Prototype of these injuries are acute hepatitis, rarely autoimmune, Wilson's, or drug-induced liver disease. If with bilirubin high. Let's do INR and we see. Suppose it is very high. Probably we are doing with dysfunction, and it is in a short history. Probably we are doing with a child is progressing towards a liver failure. Less than one percent of this kid can progress to liver failure. If we get low albumin along with all this picture, probably we are dealing with a chronic liver disease which started decompensating, and it can be a very first presentation of a chronic liver disease directly as a decompensation, which is also possible. Suppose this liver function test would have got more of a pro pro bilirubin would have been out of proportion to the other derangement. Then probably we are dealing with the intrahepatic cholestatic disease. In these cases, generally INR is prolonged. But if you give vitamin K, it gets corrected, and generally albumin is normal. These are like sclerosing cholangitis, cystic fibrosis, and other diseases which are again rare. And sometimes we get. AST, LT, and bilirubin is not very high, but alkaline phosphatase and gamma GT, which is very very high, it means we are dealing with an infiltrative disorders like TB or tuberculosis of the liver or lymphomas or the storage disease. So here our child has a mostly a hepatitis picture. So typical investigations we discuss with the liver function test and INR. Generally, etiological workup we can uh, select. Uh, like doing hepatitis A IgM, hepatitis HEV IgM, HBS AG, and if you are doing hepatitis B, one should also look for IgM against hepatitis C core antibodies. 
if they are negative child is having has previous history of jaundice and again because hepatitis a and hepatitis c generally cause jaundice once in the life if you are getting a second time jaundice probably then probably this hepatitis a and he is unlikely then we we can extend our further work up to see are we dealing with any autoimmune liver disease by doing ana asma lkm1 or wilson disease which is quite common in our indian population by doing a seroloplasmin also look for a history of any drug intake like tuberculous drugs very common att induced hepatitis then anti convulsant drugs leading to liver failure again very common many ayurvedic medications then accidental poisoning though paracetamol poisoning is not very common rat poison uh, again it's uh, it's not very common but it is seen quite frequently you see the rat poison is easily available at any uh, local train station it's it is very cheaply available so by accidentally sometimes children can uh, eat it then in neonates we see for herpes simplex cmv or ebv infection okay so what how should we manage on opd basis generally all these kids needs only supportive therapy there is no medicine which cures jaundice herbal medicine use of steroids or liver protective agents they are scientifically they are not useful but yes children uh, patients demand for medicine any medicine which is not harmful one may give but most of the evidence doesn't support usefulness of this medicine in terms of decreasing jaundice or any preventing any mortality liver related to liver dysfunction some medicines if we don't know the mechanism of action because most of the medicines are excreted by the liver biliary system they can get accumulated in the liver so be very cautious using any medicines better to counsel them and tell them probably these medicines are not useful there is no need of very extensive investigations if this child clinical is improving there is no encephalopathy and on a clinical examination we see that okay the liver span is maintained but we should be vigilant about any prompt recognition and complications and if we are getting any acute hepatitis b or c one should look for follow up routinely for chronicity what's most important is the diet it's very really a controversial issue in management of acute acute viral uh, hepatitis most of the norms are restrict certain foods like restrict oil turmeric spices because they look yellow but there are no uh, recommendations for restrict them and if you see most of the families go for a very high uh, carbohydrate rich diet like asking for juice and getting if you see in most of the house outside hospital there are nicely uh, flourished uh, fruit juice stalls and patients are taking juices and giving to the patients so this is uh, so scientifically it's not required when there is no need to restrict oil turmeric and spices what is the family's diet what are the culturally acceptable diet the same uh, the child can continue the same diet if in a in a prodromal stage if children take more of a sugar Uh, related food they actually these foods have very high osmolality and they are they can cause nausea they can cause vomiting so this food uh, the juices and can be avoided plus if you are taking a juices from a uh, roadside juicer so again it is another we know that hepatitis a and e are, and are spread by a fecal oral route so we are again giving one more reason so they can after maybe 6 weeks or 8 weeks they can come with a typhoid fever so it's not required so a uh, homemade good food is required if they restrict their diet these children do come with the weight loss whenever they have a prolonged jaundice uh, let's go to a second case now here we have a 11 years old boy who again had prodrome bilirubin was if you see i just uh, kept the figure figure almost like the same but this child has prolonged jaundice is lasted for a 45 days but this child has a one additional component they started having itching after 10 to 15 days if you see his bilirubin has gone quite high it's 23 by 18 but what is important is we did his synthetic function alkaline phosph uh, as uh, sgpt was not very high inr was correctable after uh, this uh, uh, mild elevation and if we did his etiological work up his practice e was positive is he continued to have prodromal for this he was then treated with uh, your um, udca 
uh, with that again his itching didn't respond so we added rifampicin which is used for itching in uh, and after uh, two months of the time his itching decreased we we, we stop all this medicine and in the fall of this child this child was clinically normal if you see his bilirubin was very high so this is a what a cholestatic presentations of uh, acute viral hepatitis this kind of patients need a follow up and the key is basically a maintained synthetic function now here if you see this child was falling in the second column where the picture of one a cholestatic disease so around if you see in hospital data Uh, of uh, institutes around eight to ten percent of these children can have uh, acute viral hepatitis can have a cholestatic picture. So AVH related, if you see uh, the older the kid, they are more likely to have a cholestatic presentation, and irrespective of whatever the etiology, children can have a cholestasis as a presentation. Uh, so generally, in this uh, children, the bilirubin is out of the proportion to the ASTLT uh, elevation. and they have a good outcome so there are many series from india and outside which has documented this phenomenon now let's uh, see a third case here we have a 7 years old girl who has he who has a similar uh, first a prodrome followed by she has an a jaundice which decreased initially there was a bilirubin of 16 ast alt in the thousands but later on is decreased so but after a period of uh, 15 to 20 days again bilirubin has gone up and sgot sgpt has again gone up from the uh, uh, again we gained the 1000 so this kind of picture what we call it as a relapsing hepatitis if you see throughout this course this her synthetic function were well inr increased but after vitamin k again it improved and on the follow up there was no decompensation her, her liver size remained well it, there was no irregularity there was no splenomegaly in this child there was no decompensation in terms of ascites encephalopathy or itching and her hepatitis a in etiology was positive on the follow up of 3 uh, uh, to 4 months the child has come her uh, liver function is completely normalized and she clinically she, this child was normal so this we call is as a relapsing hepatitis so uh, generally most of the first episode generally settles in a one uh, an average of one month time and then there is a second surge of the symptoms where transaminases and bilirubin both goes up if you saw the previous case only bilirubin went up so that is the cholestatic picture here it is a recurrent hepatitis so that generally they need a close follow up generally they do not have a chronic sequelae but uh, but all patients may not be like that let's see an, uh, another case similar children similar a uh, child who had again had the jaundice followed by uh, so, uh, which was initially you know, the child has a prodrome this jaundice initially settled enzyme settled and his he this child had an hepatitis uh, a positive uh, but if you see the jaundice remained for 6 months astlt also re, uh, remain elevated gradually is inr was 1.6 was after vitamin k didn't correct it this child came to me at around 6 or 7 months of this follow up and if on examination his liver was a little firm irregular this child had a splenomegaly on examination the left lobe was also palpable now the inr was 3.2 this child had ascites and so this is here this here it was hepatitis a is triggered an autoimmune liver disease the child's ana was very high it was 1 is to 2 2400 and never seen such a high ana in children and this child had a typical autoimmune liver disease which started as hepatitis a that's why follow up is very important and we started this child on uh, steroid and azathioprine ideally biopsy is required but because of high inr we couldn't do biopsy in this child and despite Uh, starting on immunosuppression the child went in grade 1 encephalopathy inr become 4.2 and this child required liver transplantation because this child was worsening so if suppose this child could have presented earlier and we started this treatment maybe at least a month prior this child, we could have saved this child from liver transplantation now another interesting case so here we have a 15 years old boy who has nausea and vomiting around 3 years prior It's up, so he at that time so this is a typical picture of a viral hepatitis where bilirubin but very high 15 and conjugated was 5 uh, 
SGPT was in more than 10 times elevated and it was a short duration jaundice. It improved on its own and his hepatitis E was positive. After that, he has multiple episodes of jaundice for which he was admitted. Once he was admitted, many times were treated on OPD basis. All jaundice were of a short duration. Was extensively evaluated on OPD basis. Hepatitis A, hepatitis E, IgM were negative. His seroloplasmin were also normal. His ultrasound was done multiple times. The liver and spleen were normal. Now this child was now stays in hostel and is regularly eats outside. So every time he was labeled as viral hepatitis, but all the workup was negative. Now this now uh, this child uh, on examination he was there was no hepatosplenomegaly. His growth was normal, but child was quite depressed because he he every after every few months this child required medical care and it was difficult to stay him in a hostel because he was labeled that he had a, some jaundice disease and uh, his and they were uh, the hostel administration was basically they are worried about that he may spread jaundice to other kids also but otherwise this child was clinically stable so if you see his liver function test which was there from last year if you see that this child has predominantly unconjugated jaundice out of six only one is conjugated recently only 0.8 out of six his SGOT SGOT were bang normal if you see the first episode they are quite high but in subsequent episode this never elevated in the last three years his albumin was also normal his SG and his his GGT and alkaline phosphatase, which takes, tells someone unlikely that he was having any biliary disorder. So what are we dealing with? So this is basically an unconjugated hyperbilirubinia. This is quite common. So this child, we suspected Gilbert syndrome. We uh, perform UGT1A1 polymorphism, which is a simple blood test. Reports are available in seven to eight days. So this was a Gilbert syndrome. This doesn't need an active ma management. This jaundice fluctuates with any physical stress or illness or dehydration. So they just need a counseling uh, that whenever the patient is, there is a summer season or any illness. So this jaundice can go up and documentation of this is very important because whenever any doctor detects jaundice, they treat it as some liver disease and, and this child spends a lot of money in medical treatment, which is totally unwarranted. Now this child has resumed his, uh, his uh, studies in the hostel and basically the council is the thing that works. Now here, uh, let's uh, move on to another case. Here we have a 14 years old girl who has a pro she has again uh, symptoms like a problem na nausea and vomiting pain in abdomen. Then she has a jaundice which was lasting for 14 days and then day five her SGOT was very high that was 3000. If you see, but here the, she had also a fever which was very high and persisting. If you see a typical viral hepatitis as after uh, the, the jaundice goes up gradually the symptoms of the prodrome and the fever subsides a continuation of the fever tells us probably okay we are dealing something else on examination this child has a hepatomegaly and splenomegaly also liver was formed and look wise she was toxic her total leukocyte count was not very high she has conjugated hyperbilirubinia and ast alt sgot and sgpt were in 500 and 800 her hepatitis A was positive, but clinically, if you see the persistence of fever raised the possibility that we are dealing something else. So another thing that as an INR, we are normal. So we did um, the Vidal test and blood culture. They were suggestive of this child has also enteric fever. So this association is quite commonly seen because both of these diseases are spread by fecal oral so hepatitis A, sometimes we get first hepatitis A and after six weeks they get enteric fever. Sometimes both can have presentation at the same time. So she was started on sensitive antibiotics to which she settled and in the follow-up, uh, this child completely recovered. So when, when we are getting an acute hepatitis and persistent fever, in, uh, so we look, uh, so what we see that fever persist even after the appearance of the jaundice, there can be associated with high grade uh, chills, a minor transfer is generally if around not very high, if you are not dealing with an acute hepatitis A or hepatitis E. 
and sometimes there can be other systemic manifestations here the child was toxic looking her tlcs were low so we look for an other topical infections like are we dealing with any malarial hepatopathy are we dealing with enteric hepatitis are we dealing with any biliary obstructions and the child has cholangitis and because of that if the child is having fever and child is toxic or there might be some other infections like leptospirosis spirosis so this so, so uh, hepatitis and the fever is quite common scenario in indian population so once in one is like as this case there is an enteric fever so generally of the uh, hospital studies shows that around 10 to 20% of this uh, in uh, enteric fever can have an hepatitis and they have very high fever they have relative bradycardia transaminate is generally at 3 to 6 times upper normal limit if you see a viral hepatitis typically they are 5 to 10 times here there was an overlap that's why ast and alt were very high ast is preferentially more than alt so sometimes some uh, ratios like alt to ldh ratio is less than 4 they said it's enteric if more than 5 it's said an acute viral hepatitis however they are validated in adults in pediatric populations they are not validated one study uh, just published in indian pediatric that shows in children this ratio is like alt to ldh ratio was less than 9 but they are very non specific they can just give us a hint but better to diagnose and prove it now viral hepatitis and leptospirosis so here again we have get extra hepatic symptoms more like fever chills conjunctival uh, redness generalized weakness muscle tenderness sometimes hemorrhagic manifestations the uh, jaundice is present in a severe one and around 15 to 20% of the cases but here what is important in if you are suspecting that uh, let's uh, her cpk is high and there is a polymorphonuclear leukocytosis is there if you see a urinary there is proteinuria so proteinuria raised cpk can give us a hint towards a leptospirosis then malaria related hepatopathy is also seen around 8 to 30% of the severe uh, malaria cases sometimes there can be an isolated falciparin infection sometimes can be mixed infection here again you have persistent fever and if we see it's a hepatopathy so enzymes are gen not very high they are generally in the range of 100 if you see a hepatic viral hepatitis they go in 400 500 and sometimes even thousands so this gives a clue towards the diagnosis of a hip, probably a malaria and a fever uh, hepatitis Now again, a third co uh, next common infection in our scenario is a dengue fever. Here again, we get sometimes fever which is biphasic. Extra hepatic symptoms are far more. There is hepatitis is more, but jaundice is not very high. But rarely, we, but many times we do get AST and ALT very very high in thousands. But generally, most of the time they settle. uh many times we do get a call if that is a dengue related hepatitis enzymes in thousand inr is very high is it an indication for a liver transplant but most of the time uh, generally they recover on their own they need a standard management of uh, dengue hip, uh, fever so that was the last case Uh, so with this, uh, uh, the take-home messages are that acute viral hepatitis, the most common cause uh, in children, is viral hepatitis. Close follow-up and selective tests guide us to a right decision. One should look for various patterns, which are quite common, like uh, like relapsing hepatitis, cholestatic hepatitis, and infective hepatitis. Sometimes any uh, presentation can be a first uh, presentation of a chronic liver disease, and one should not miss it. So, quite other chronic illnesses like autoimmune liver diseases, Wilson diseases is quite common in Indian children, and one should look for it. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, we can take it in a chat box. Um, hi, Dr. Vibhor. That was an excellent talk. Uh, all the cases were very diverse, very interesting. and i think your uh, lecture highlights the importance of a good clinical exam as well as ordering and interpreting the labs correctly because the causes can be very diverse uh, we have uh, will be taking questions towards the end so all attendees please uh, type in your questions at the, uh, in the chat and we'll be taking at the end of all the three lectures mm. um, puja puja but, take yes, after sir. each lecture yeah i'll okay. be doing after this lecture okay so if any questions i will i can sure. take it and uh, address okay, it sure. yeah 
Okay, I don't see uh, any questions, uh, but I have a two to myself. Okay. Uh, so one is related to uh, you know the use of alternative medicine that is homeopathy and uh, Ayurved uh, in treatment of a lot of chronic disorders. Like we, I see them as a neurologist where especially for behavioral disorders, uh, parents like to start alternative therapy. Now, are there any precautions that uh, children should be taking? A parent should be taking you know while taking these medications because we've seen adults with presenting with liver failure years later. Uh, because of use of certain medications. So is there any anything from your end that you should be advising them for? Uh, it's a very uh, good question. Uh, so the most problem with the other this medication is we don't know the pharma pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of this medicine. So we will be never able to give a proper answer to this question. As a doctor, we always, many a times, we reach a dead end where we always say okay are not working and when parent asks okay i have another medicine should i give on what basis we can say they no that's mainly true with right. the chronic illnesses so then what is the way out first thing if you uh, miss and this generally the organs that we are worried about is either damage to the liver or damage to the kidneys these are the main organs so when many patients are taking like this you can ask them to get a list. many many these drugs can have an idiosyncratic reactions they may not be time bound so you mm -hmm. can basically ask them to do their liver function test after uh, one month to two months of time and follow up and and can see okay if they are safe probably they are safe okay but what i'm saying is suppose already this suppose these organs are damaged because are the two main organs from where the medicines are excreted they do not take the risk okay all right and my second okay we have a question from dr sinha uh, how do you interpret inr and what is the normal sorry how do you interpret inr uh, normal and, and what is the normal okay so normal inr is around 0.8 to 1.1 that we take it as a normal Abnormal INR, we take it as more than 1.5 is an abnormal INR. 1.1 to 1.5, I'll take it as a window and that needs a observation. When you are getting any INR, which is more, one, more than 1.5, we always see if it is because of a vitamin K deficiency. Single dose of vitamin K, which is adequate for a neonates, I'll say is give it 1 mg. Any child who is less than 10 kg, 2.5 mg, more than that, 5 mg. Adults, even 10 mg is okay. After a single in, uh, injection of vitamin K, in a duration of 6 to 8 hours, this INR should correct. It means your liver function is normal. So correct means it should go to a less than 1.5. So if you are persistently elevated INR of more than 1.5 after vitamin K, I will say it is abnormal INR. Okay, I think that answers the question nicely. Uh, we have uh, two other questions related to acute viral hepatitis. One is, uh, what is the diet that you advise for uh, acute hep viral hepatitis? And is there any ways to prevent it? Yeah. So uh, diet-wise, it has to be a normal diet. What is the family's diet? Child should eat it. So there is no need of restriction of a turmeric oil or salt do not need uh, it is not uh, necessary that child should have a bland diet what it does it affects nutrition any catabolic state requires a good nutrition you are going to decrease or limit his diet child is going to lose weight most of the time uh, these illnesses are a week duration doesn't affect but many illnesses have shown two months three months is a part of acute viral hepatitis these children come with a severe weight loss so they are, mm -hmm. are not required Okay. Um, another question is, uh, what is the percentage of Gilbert sy uh, syndrome in the normal population? So it's very, very high. You will be surprised. The percentage around 2 to 3%. Some countries even 5%. It's so very common. So typically what we see sometimes as a uh, muddy sclera, they might be having a Gilbert uh, syndrome. 
uh, uh, if you see a very famous examination of Gilbert syndrome, probably uh, in Mahabharata, we have a Pandu Raja who has probably jaundice. So that might be one the Gil. Otherwise, he was he was a Kshatriya who was a warrior. He didn't die of any illness, bodily illness. So mm-hmm. you a jaundice with healthy uh, human being. That's what we call as a Gilbert. And it's, and it's very, very common. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, how do you identify a carrier state or a chronic state in hepatitis B infection? Okay. So hepatitis a uh, B infection again. It's it will be a totally um, it will be a separate basically a talk. So yeah. most common is well, so it depends on what age of a child we are treating with. Most of the time uh, when we so I'll first answer for a child, then I'll answer for an adult. So generally, most of the children when they get hepatitis B infection, more they generally get a vertical infection from a mother. So in that case children are what we call as an immune tolerant phase. Their hepatitis B viral load is very high that goes in lags, but liver function test, if you did, they are normal. We call it as an immune tolerant phase. In this phase, the children have hepatitis B infection, but hepatitis B is not causing any damage to the liver, so that doesn't need a treatment. Generally, in the second or third decade of life, most of the time, this, uh, this uh, viral load comes down and there is an inflammation sets in. We should know what is the normal liver uh, SGOT and SGPT level. The normal SGOT and SGPT liver in adults is 25 and 30 for males and females. If you are getting hepatitis B and your SGOT and SGPT is more than 50 or 60, you are dealing with some amount of mild inflammation. So that needs an address. And this is the point where these patients require. And the carrier state is your hepatitis B is positive and your DNA is undetectable and your absolutely normal liver function test and there is no hepatomegaly, spinomegaly on ultrasound. That is a carrier state. So that stage is where they do not need a treatment. But the in-between stage where your hepatitis B is positive and enzymes are also not very high. But you need to see a DNA what's happening because in this process from where they start inflammation to a process of in, going to a carrier state, Many a times they go to a cirrhosis, many a times they go to a hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. So I think that kind of uh, partially answers the next question. Uh, the next question that uh, what are the tests that you order for a hepatitis B infection? So besides your liver function test and your hepatitis B, like you do you order the whole profile or there are particular tests that so you would order? Mostly to hepatitis B, if it is positive, then one should do a liver function test to see inflammation and why, how, is, how much is the hepatitis B DNA. Then we also uh, do uh, how is the hepatitis E antigen and anti I. So uh, anti uh, HBE antigen antibody. Depending on that, we know whether uh, how much is the infectivity. So if uh, so, generally uh, we do complete profile if your DNA is very high. Because that will guide us the further uh, follow up and uh, further counseling, whether other family and all other important is we need to screen other family members and give vaccination to all the members who have not been vaccinated. And then we don't have to stop there. Once you give vaccination, we have to also check whether they have got uh, protective anti HBS titer or not. If they have not got protective anti HBS titer, again, the family members are liable for infection. So we need to protect the family as well. Okay. And these are all blood tests, right? There is no role of a liver biopsy at this point for hepatitis no, B infection. Only, only blood test, blood not test. no okay. liver biopsy at this point. Only uh, uh, Rarely they will need, but most of the time with the blood test is okay. Okay. Uh, one more question on hepatitis B. Uh, I think we have a few minutes, I think, to take the last few questions. Um, Management of a, I know this would be a separate topic, but what is the management of a hepatitis, uh, baby born to a hepatitis B positive mother? Uh, when do you test? How do you give hep- uh, the hepatitis B immunoglobulin? So uh, I think our next talk should be hepatitis B. I think so. Yes. <laughs> okay, fine. So if a uh, mother, so what is important? Uh, we should screen all mothers for hepatitis B when they are antipartum. When hepatitis B viral DNA is very, very high, all this mother needs to be started on antivirals once they are in a seventh or third trimester that decreases the vertical transmission. 
once we once we know that a uh, mother has there is a hbs ag positive mother and that likely and she is going to deliver first is universal precaution for all of us who are going to take care of the at the time of the delivery and the child will need immunoglobulin and vaccine both within first 12 hours of life suppose you miss it you can give it to next 48 hours if you miss it still give it to next 7 days but do but till 7 days still there is window efficacy will go down but you can right. you give it a try till 7 day but try to give it in less than 12 hours that is most important first vaccine we first dose we call it as a zero dose and do not count in the vaccination and after 6 weeks of onwards we start with the routine vaccination and then at general even if suppose the child is positive we are not going to start the treatment best way at 18 months of the age do hbv dna pcr from the blood for the baby and see if positive or negative rarely uh, and and uh, the vertical transmission is quite important cause for a liver failure in neonates if mother's viral load is very high that was seen quite high in a in the countries where they are in a high prevalence rate like a korea but uh, and uh, so uh, so to prevent this neonatal liver failure one should go ahead with the vaccination and immunoglobulin Okay, I think the last question would be: um, How do you calculate indirect jaundice? Is it fifteen or fifty percent of the total? Okay, so um, two definitions in textbook: one for you and two zero fifteen and twenty. That won't mm-hmm. matter much. So if you have jaundice, is uh, total bilirubin is ten. It means if you have conjugated jaundice is more than fifteen or twenty percent means more than one point for you or two. Milligram per dear, it is. Uh, it is of a conjugated one. Another thing, if your total bilirubin is less than five, then this labs error rate is very very high. So when is total bilirubin is less than five, any conjugated jaundice more than one milligram per uh, deciliter is equivalent to a conjugated jaundice, and that needs evaluation. At least follow. I think Doctor Shivastav has one question. Good afternoon, Doctor uh, Vibor. Yeah, I'm Doctor Shivasa from Yeah, I'm Doctor Shivasa from Pune, Jangir, and Western Pearl. I have one question. What is the prevalence and association of this uh, viral load of hepatitis A, B, C, D, or E going into fulminant acute uh, liver failure? Okay, so uh, I'll give the complete. Uh, so B, C, so for hepatitis A and E, generally. 80% will be anecteric 20% will have uh, jaundice around uh, 5 to 6% will have very severe course and less than 1% will have a liver failure so the percentage of those who actually go in the liver failure is less but many times they do may, uh, all patients we know that do not undergo a hepatitis a and hepatitis e uh, even though uh, this uh, serology tests so is the viral load important in that case sir A any viral load is not important. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let me see. I think we have we have no more questions. Uh, I think you answered all our questions really, really well. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor Vibor, for your talk. Uh, I would like to now introduce uh, our next speaker. Um, you may stop sharing the screen, Doctor Vibor. Yeah, uh, so our next speaker is. Uh, Dr. Sumit Pawar, a dynamic neurosurgeon at SRCC Children's Hospital, um, he is going to talk on a clinically relevant topic, which is management of head injury in children. Dr. Sumit, you may share your screen. Yeah, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I will be speaking something about the head injury in children. It is always very bad to speak after Dr. Vibor uh, and uh, before Dr. Ruchi. Both of them are such awesome speakers, and uh, they cover the topic so beautifully that I forget what I have to talk. Uh, but we have to be where we have to be. I am in between the two great speakers, Dr. Ruchi and Dr. Vibor. Uh, I will be uh, covering a very small topic of head injury in children. mainly the management as we see it in our day to day practice not the hospital setting how we manage it and everything the more practical relevant stuff 
uh, we are in the COVID times. Uh, there is a new normal. We have to segregate the cases as per the elective, emergency, and urgent. We need to see uh, that patients are treated at home and not in the hospital as much as possible. It reduces the risk for everyone. Our risk of exposure, the patient's risk of getting exposed to the disease, and everything. Uh, so, head injury is more appropriately termed as a traumatic brain injury. It can be mild, moderate, or severe based on the GCA scale. So, head injury or a traumatic brain injury covers an injury to the scalp, or the skull, or the brain, or any associated injuries along with that. Uh, I think I'm only the host for the meeting, so because of which I am getting all these chat messages. Anyways, so problem statement: Traumatic brain injury is a leading cause of death and disability in children. There is a similarity in the pattern of injury that we see in adults, which is what we are more used to. But there are some distinctive features that are different in the pediatric uh, head injury as compared to the adult head injury. So what are the differences? Essentially, the age-related structural changes. The pediatric brain is not myelinated. So uh, the unmyelination causes there are more, uh, uh, possibly there is more risk of having a shearing injury as compared to a myelinated brain. Second thing in adults, the skull is fully closed and sealed. In pediatric uh, population, the skull is quite mobile. The sutures are not fused. So they have a relatively high capacity to absorb the impact. Uh, second thing, the size of the head in children is surface area is much bigger than that in adults, uh, the relative proportion to the body. So any injury can have a much more bigger impact if there is on the head uh, as compared to children. Second difference is the mode of injury. Uh, kids keep on running. They have a Brownian kind of movement. We don't have an adult who ran very fast and just banged his head on the wall uh, or banged his head on the edge of the table or some sharp device. Uh, some sharp structure or furniture. This is very common in children and not in adults. Third thing that we have difficulty is that there is a difficulty in examining the pediatric population. So you have a child who has a normal, regular head injury that we have had when you were small. But still, the kind of tantrum they are going to throw with that, they are not going to allow you to examine them. Uh, forget the pupil examination, even though you can't examine the wound that has occurred uh, in the that too in the hair. So examination becomes a bit more difficult in the pediatric population. Now, to give a very common example of a difference in adult and pediatric age group, the scalp injury and blood loss. Suppose uh, an adult has a scalp injury, has some 20, 25 mil blood loss. It's not a big worry. We just give a compression and that's okay. In an uh, infant, a uh, 25 mil blood loss can just set the put the patient into a shock. It can be very, very severe kind of a head injury or a scalp injury, like as simple as a cut in the on the skull. Uh, on the in the scalp can cause uh, uh, push the patient into a shock. This is a one distinctive feature in a pediatric head injury as compared to adult head injury. So we have to be more vigilant. If you see this scale over here, the severity of head injury, most of the patient can be treated at home. They don't need to be admitted. They don't need to be uh, even uh, like seriously observed or require medical attention. Small percentage require admission and very small they can have death as well. So our job is to manage this and to prevent them from going into this category. So if you see age-wise, the mode of injury is going to be different and there are some unique features as per the age. A newborn child is more likely to have a delivery-related head injury more than anything else. Of course, if there is a premature low birth weight uh, and hypoxemic uh, infant or a newborn, they have a higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Otherwise, the birth-related injuries are the more big, big problem than anything else. Infants who are not uh, really walking or running around, they have more likelihood of having an accidental head injury due to inappropriate childcare practices or an abusive head trauma. Uh, whenever there is, we are not sure of what is the mode of injury. Okay, fall from bed is uh, significantly common in India because we don't have the beds that are very, we don't have the bed safety kids sleep on our beds only and they don't have a separate bed for themselves. So that's one possibility. Other than that, child abuse is something you have to look for in injury in infants. Of course, when the uh, they, uh, kids become toddlers and school going children, accidental head injury is much more common. They develop motor abilities, but they run haywire. They don't have very exact control when to stop or they don't have any judgment or they don't want to see where is a sharp object that is coming. 
they will bang into it and have an injury here the child safety seats or the child safety gear the making your home child proof is very very important as compared to any other age group of course adolescents and teenagers bike related injury and motorcycle related injury is much more common plus a sports related head injuries are also common in sports like soccer rugby in india kabaddi kho kho they can lead to these head injuries uh, proper gear is very very important now once this cause as per the age we have seen second thing we need to see is the uh, structural consideration so skin or the scalp in children is very very vascular it is very thin so the cushion that normally we get because of the scalp kids don't get as much the coverage even the cranium the calvinum is very soft and rich in bone marrow uh, it can bleed a lot but because it is pliable so there is no very good protection to the brain per se but it can absorb a lot more injuries as against our diploid skulls have two thick cortical layers and in between you have a diploid layer which can lead to a very good bumper or a bonnet like action which kids don't have and like i discussed the brain fibers malnutrition can cause a more shearing injury they don't get cut easily but shearing is much more common in them and of course the head is bigger in children the neck is of course very small the muscles are not well developed so they can have a very uh, dangerous whiplash kind of injury in the neck or the sprain of the neck or even atlantoaxial dislocations are common the entire weight is being taken care of the moment is controlled by ligaments and not the muscles and the bones vertebra are not nicely ossified at that age so causes when we see the causes of head injury very commonly first most common in india would be accidental falls either they fall or they bang into something second most common would be a motor vehicular injury where kids either uh, they are in india we have a habit of having the kids on a lap when we are uh, when the someone else is driving that can be very very dangerous thing because the, they are the first thing that can be thrown off or hitting the windshield that kind of injury is dangerous second thing kids running on the street and vehicle hitting them is also a very dangerous mode of injury both come into motor vehicle injuries sports related injury is very common in the western world in spite of having all the protection that they use they use a helmet they have the rugby uh, you know the big covering that they have on the shoulder pads see this kids they are having the shoes with studs and everything padded socks they are wearing in india when we play kabaddi and kho kho and we go out to play when the game really starts uh, building uh, excitement we remove our shoes and then we start playing and then we feel now we are playing nicely so this cultural differences that we have make us more prone to sports related injury than any other kid any other kids child abuse is something we don't want to talk about uh, in lockdown period this is something that we need to really look into as a family physician as a practitioner you need to see signs whether they are being child abused in the family uh, nobody has to talk about it but you must see for signs if there are multiple aged injuries the child is not speaking nicely in srcc we have a protocol every single head injury we have to do an mlc every child is shown to a clinical psychologist and they come and discuss casually what happened how it happened and everything just to see if there is any sign of child abuse there is a very thin line between discipline and abuse that uh, sometimes gets abused so this is the variety of symptoms that can be presented in a head injury we look at mild symptoms like raise or swollen uh, area or bump a shallow cut on the scalp headache you know these are very very common any confusion light headedness dizziness problem in balance very common they are expected after any kind of head injury when mod we call it moderate to severe when you have these symptoms of mild plus there is some loss of consciousness or a severe headache that does not go to go away incessant crying in some children repeated nausea vomiting loss of short term memory slurred speech difficulty in walking any effect focal neurological deficit these are the times when we need to be more vigilant and consider them to be a moderate or severe head injury if you want to see the types of head injury we generally covered as external head injury and internal head injury so external we have the bruises and bumps swelling that very commonly we have seen in our childhood they can be scalp lacerations or cuts and internal can be a bit serious ones like the skull fracture bleed in the brain contusion and diffuse axial injury these cover about more than 90% of your all head injuries so we're going to speaking about this this management usually it covers in the tertiary care center in the hospital i'll just be touching upon these points but not going too much into details for this 
uh, internal head injuries. People can have only external head injury without having any internal head injury. Always there is minimal injury is going to be there, but you can't have any internal head injury without having any external signs or symptoms. This is what we have to be looking for. To explain the external head injury, I think it is better that we go for question answer session over here rather than go for a detail, like, you know, this happens and that happens. This is what patients and other parents are going to come to you with. My child had a fall. He has developed a bump over his forehead. What should I do? So first is reassurance. Make the child stop crying. Let him be comfortable. Second thing is ice pack. Apply ice pack or ice cubes in a socks. Don't apply ice directly, but covered with a cloth or put it in socks. And then you apply it on the area where there's a bump. Every 20 minutes for three to four hours, it will reduce the swelling. Inflammation subsides. It reduces the swelling will come down and the child feels better. It eases some pain. You have to watch the child for the next 24 hours. And red flag signs are, of course, continuous crying. That is not, he's not stopping crying, drowsiness, persistent vomiting, or loss of consciousness. My child vomited after hitting his head against the wall. Should I get a CT scan done? One vomiting. See, kids, they will cry after they have a head injury. After crying a lot, they tend to vomit also once. That's absolutely fine. One vomiting, it's okay. If he's vomiting repeatedly or after some time has passed and then suddenly out of the blue, he vomits once, that is something that you need to see if it is serious or not. So I would say one vomiting is acceptable. More than two, two or more than two, you should seek medical attention. CT scan may definitely be worthwhile. Uh, so red flag here is definitely persistent vomiting projectile vomiting and vomiting after an interval. Third is my child had a head injury, but it is his nap time. Should I keep him awake? If the child, occur, if the fall occurs at a time near his bedtime, nap time and all, let them sleep. Don't stop them from sleeping, but you must, you can't sleep at the same time. You need to keep an eye on them. Watch for their breathing. If it is regular, irregular breathing, then you have to be very vigilant for it. If they're looking pale, if they're looking colorless, looking good, you try to wake the child up after some time. Let them be irritable. They should be irritated and they should try to sleep again. If they're in, if they are not waking up nicely, you wake them up completely. And just to be sure that they are fine, moving hands and legs, answering a question or two, getting irritable, that's fine. If they're not waking up or they're remaining drowsy, you must seek medical attention urgently. So should I, should the child sleep? Yes, they can sleep, but you should be vigilant and keep on checking them again and again and again. Persistent drowsiness is bad and that you must take them to the hospital or send them to the hospital immediately. Child had a deep cut in the scalp, is bleeding profusely. This, like we discussed earlier, is a red flag sign. You have to apply compression. If there's a cut, don't apply pressure on the cut. Apply the pressure on the edges. That's where the bleeding is going to come from. Typically, suppose you have a cut in this direction, blood supply comes from the from below to upwards. So try to apply pressure in the proximal rather than a distal end. Usually that will stop the bleeding. Immediate medical attention is required. Once you apply pressure, you put some gauze piece out, give a compression over there, and then you wrap a bandage around the head. Don't put a big, big gauze pieces over there. It just soaks all the blood inside over there. And you would not know if there is bleeding and you would just keep on thinking that everything is fine, but actually bleeding is getting accumulated and you don't know it and patient might just go into shock. So if there is a excessively bleeding in a child or visible mobile bone fragment is seen, it means the, it's a compound fracture or there's a foreign body in the wound. That is when you have to go to a doctor and get it clean, maybe a neurosurgeon or a general surgeon. As a general practitioner, how do I assess the child in my clinic when the child comes? So as we have discussed, mild, moderate, whatever we have question we discussed is fine. This question remains for child who is drowsy, not for a conscious child. In conscious child, we don't check their GCS. This is a Glasgow coma scale. It should be done in kids who are suspecting or want to grade a coma. So this is the adult on the left hand side. You can see this is the adult GCS. If it is age is more than four years of age, this is a pediatric GCS scale. The eye opening part remains same. You just shout the patient's name. He should be looking around. If he's not looking around, just take his name, give him a pinch or just a rub sternum uh, on the sole of the foot or sole of the foot. See if there's any response to that or no response to pain is grade one. 
same for the motor you have to see if they are following nicely lift up your hands move both hands move both legs you have to see movement in that case give a painful stimulus like rubbing on the sternum or on the foot or we generally give the supra orbital pain over here which is very nicely centrally located and can give a very nice differentiation of the flexion and abnormal flexion and see the score over there when it comes to the verbal response that is when you have to there is a difference in the adult gcs score and the pediatric you have to see if the child is appropriate words or social smell fixing and following you uh, is crying but still consolable persistent irritable of crying lowers the gcs and moans to pain and no response to pain is a very very sinister sign the total of the score is what you gives you a gcs out of 15 if you have to do only one examination the most important prognostication factor is the motor response if the motor response is down patient is down these have a value but motor response is the most accurate in prognostication uh, along with the pupillary response if you can check that <clears throat> so now you know the gcs of the child when do you do a ct scan in a head injury if there is any sign of a basal skull fracture on the secondary survey so when do are you suspect a basal skull fracture if you have raccoon eyes if there is bleeding around the eye black discoloration around the eye that is going to give an appearance of a raccoon eye you have seen in the movie so many times the hero is punched in the eye he has a black eye over here or if there is bleeding behind the ear the discoloration over here that's called a battle sign it's seen in a mastoid fracture only skull base fracture of the temporal bone any fracture in the anterior skull base you can have a black eye there is any leaking from the nose water discharge from the nose or from the back of the mouth or from the ear is dangerous there is any deficit there is a weakness in the hand or in the leg there is suspicion of an open or depressed skull fracture we'll come to it later on any gcs less than 8 gcs less than 8 means a severe traumatic brain injury patient needs to be hospitalized immediately in the icu he will require intubation and further management gcs that is persistently below 13 below 13 you would say the child is confused a confused child who is not answering properly who is not very well oriented has difficulty in movement or prefers to sleep that is what you call a gcs less than 15 or uh, less than 13 when you suspect a non accidental injury you don't know the mode of injury in that case you cannot actually prognosticate ki okay this was just hitting on the wall so that's okay or it's a child abuse that you're suspecting then you need to do a ct scan and any seizure that occurs more than 2 minutes after impact there is another protocol that we usually follow the canadian ct protocol but that's not applicable for children it's very accurate for adults so less than 16 years of age we should follow these protocols these are much more accurate design what you should look for is the risk of radiation and need for sedation so children who had had a head injury when they go to hospital they're not going to be very readily be uh, ready for a ct scan in that case when you have to sedate a child as a neurologist or a neurosurgeon my complete examination stops once the child is sedated so you really have to see whether they need to be sedated second thing sedation in children when you give any benzodiazepines or any of these drugs they can cause a very serious respiratory depression so we have had an episode in one of the private hospitals outside where big hospital they did a ct scan of the child anesthetist was there for standby but he could not intubate the child when child slip into uh, severe respiratory depression by the time pediatrician came code blue had to be paged and it was a very 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 uh, messed up case because of that so see that you do a ct scan at a center which has a backup of a pediatric person who can intubate very easily and very nicely there is no rule of i had do but i am not really sure if i can intubate this child be really sure that's why i always recommend any head injury please come to srcc we have everything in place we can manage your case a to z mostly will not require anything but if there is something required we can take care of that part so as we have discussed the bruises and bumps skull laser, scalp laceration we have discussed over here skull fracture something about it these are the four kind of fracture that you usually see a linear straight away line fracture non displaced fracture uh, there is just a crack in the skull nothing else a depressed fracture when the there is multiple line of fracture and the dura is intact usually and then there is a bump that you can see uh, indentation of the skull there can be sutures that can be separated or a basal fracture which is quite sinister so let's take them one by one a linear fracture is when you just have a crack in the skull nothing else now if you see this case over here you can this is a normal suture and there is a fracture line that you can see going over here this is a ct scan bone window i can see a significant amount of swelling on the skull on the scalp 
when you see the brain window you see there is a big extradural hematoma that has formed it's a bi convex shaped uh, swelling over here it's not very really bright on the ct scan because this is almost an 8 day old injury this is significantly liquefied clot the i tried to conserve the kid i tried not to operate her but the pain was very severe she was very miserable because of the pain it was splitting headache is what she was saying not treated and not controlled with the medication that's why we thought of operating her and uh, at the surgery a very small bore hole was made at the location of a injury and we can see that a liquefied clot is coming out as soon as you do the small bore hole that's it that was all so that was required there was complete resolution of the clot and no headache at all so linear fracture can be very simple but they can have some sinister presentation so you need to see if there is any bleeding inside this is a classical depressed fracture depressed fracture occurs when there is a bigger surface area that has hit the head uh the skull just bends inside it's cracked this bone fragment you have to see whether it is hurting the brain or not usually you can see whether the dura is intact or not if there is some air foci inside the brain we know dura is not intact if you see feel some bogginess over the scalp we know that csf has come out and dura is not intact in that case there is a chance of seizure that this kid can get we usually say that if the depression of the fracture is more than 5 mm like in this case it is definitely more than 1 uh, cm but if it is more than 5 mm we may go inside and intervene and just pull it up otherwise it is not required so if it the skin is open you must go inside no doubt about it so it's an open wound and you can see a fracture inside you have to go inside and repair otherwise patient will get meningitis and encephalitis and very 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 bad turn out of the case can occur if it is just a simple depressed fracture you may conserve it if it is too much inside or very sharp speculum you can see go in the brain you have to remove it otherwise there is a chance of a seizure uh, that can come so now one very interesting entity that comes in a depressed fracture you have a child with a uh, fracture you saw you took his x ray you do an x ray after 3 months the fracture has increased in size this is a classical case of a growing fracture of the skull what's happening over here so you have we have seen a depressed fracture over here you can see the bone fragments over here sometimes these uh, the healing tissue the galea the dura the brain matter something or the other comes between these bones there is no apposition of the bones they will not heal there is no healing they keep on getting separated with the pressure of the csf so see this is the bone for example this is a csf pocket there is a brain over here there's uh, skin over the bone there is an injury there is a fracture due to some abnormal injury there is some tissue that has grown inside it can be an adhesive tissue the fibrosis the dura matter csf it's also called as leptomeningeal cyst growing fracture and it keeps on expanding because of the continuous pressure of the csf and this this leads to an increase in the size of the uh fracture over some time in that case we have to surgically manage it and repair it completely so that there is no further growth of the fracture ping pong fracture are very very interesting that are seen in small infants just like a ping pong ball that is just bent from outside due to an abnormal pressure uh, these bones don't fracture in very small infants and they just bend inside and give this kind of an appearance we generally wait for them to pop up automatically with over a month or so they can pop up on it on their own the growth of the brain will push it out if there is no associated drop in the gcs or anything you can just conserve them they come out uh, this one kid had come to us with a delayed uh, this was a ping pong fracture he was not coming up so we used our pediatric mask applied suction to it and we fixed it over the head and see the fracture has completely resolved it was done in the opd basis and in 5 minutes itself this gives a nice appearance maybe it would have come out on its own but it was not coming out and parents were very very confused this motion not even permanent so that is our uh, coverage of the uh, fracture of the skull now when you come to intracranial bleeds they can be you know intra parenchymal it can be subdural or extradural depending on the location of the bleed inside or outside the brain and outside the brain matters so the brain coverings the meninges sometimes it can be an intraventricular bleed as well usually the management of this is conservative only the icu role is more important than anyone else's role in any kind of bleed very 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 small percentage of this pediatric population require a neurosurgeon to operate and remove the bleed 
because of the many properties in the pediatric brain, they can be managed conservatively. ICU is important. A good ICU can prevent your child, this child from getting operated. Very rarely if there's a malignant cerebral edema or the brain is very massive and there's a risk of tonsillar herniation or the kid is pupillary dilated. That case we have to do a decompressive craniotomy when we just split open the entire, uh, remove the bone flap and leave the brain open. The uh, dura will be covering this brain now and skin will be closed. There will be no bone flap that we will keep. We'll keep the bone flap again after about three months once the swelling has gone down. So this is one option. Uh, in case of an intraventricular bleed, we sometimes suppose there is a blockage, uh, ventricular bleed, and it's blocking the fourth ventricle, causing a hydrocephalus, secondary hydrocephalus over here. In that case, we may sometimes put an OMIA device. OMIA is nothing but just like your chemo port. It gives me an access to the ventricle from a button below the skin. So this tube is connected to the ventricle, and there is a nice chamber over here. I just put a needle inside. I put a scalpel and a collection bag and it keeps on bringing the CSF from there. So there's no impending hydrocephalus or acute threat to life because of the bleed that is blocked. Over time, the CSF and the bleed will liquefy, it will go off completely, and then we can remove the entire assembly. Very, very rarely, suppose there is an obstructive hydrocephalus or there is a non-communicating hydrocephalus. In that case, there is an option of doing an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, there is no rule of ETV in a traumatic brain injury. But uh, very, very rarely we may require it. We have a, uh, this case of, a, we have done ETV endoscopically. This is a non-neuronal third ventricle tissue that we are puncturing with this electrode. You can see the hole over there. After that, we direct put a Fugati three French. This is a one millimeter catheter and we are ballooning it completely to expand the hole. After serial dilatation, we can see that there is a nice dilatation of the third ventricular floor. I put my endoscope inside to check. So you can see the pulsation of the membrane over here to see that there is a nice flow of CSF uh, across the ventricles. This is the basal artery that you can see on your nine o'clock side over here. This is a basal artery. So this is where you can see it, this location. And look at this MRI. MRI is showing a very nice to and fro motion of the CSF. Uh, which is coming that the ETV is in position, ETV is working, and there is no uh, further hydrocephalus, obstructive hydrocephalus that is going to occur over here. There is almost no role of ETV in uh, head injury, but I'm just showing it because we are the only hospital in Mumbai right now who have a pediatric endoscope and are doing ETV for most of the procedure, procedures like infections to a congenital acquittal stenosis and everything else. So to summarize, if you have a case of head injury, uh, if there are bruises, you have to use ice pack and observe the kid very, very vigilantly. If they want to sleep, let them sleep. You don't sleep. If there is a laceration, sutures are uh, required if the cut is very deep. If there is fracture, watch for the raccoon eyes. Like I said, the black eyes, battle sign, there is a blood over the mastoid region behind the ear, or there's a frank depression of the skull. If there's com compound fracture, the Skin is open, surgery may be needed. We know the CT scan, when the CT scan is required, we have summarized it earlier. If there is an ICU bleed, ICU observation is more important for an ICU bleed than anything else. Decongestive therapy like mannitol, 3% NSCL is very, very important. Neurosurgical intervention like decomposite craniotomy are rarely required in today's era where we can manage the ICP very, very nicely. If hydrocephalus develops, shunt may be needed at a later stage after six weeks. To conclude, head injury is a major cause of morbidity and mortality. Most of the head injury will require only conservative therapy and no hospitalization, maximum, maximum of your patients. Moderate to severe head injury need multidisciplinary team approach with backup of CT, MRI, EEG, pediatric ICU, everything. And just remember this drawing, if you want to remember what signs are to be watched for in the first 24 hours after a head injury, uh, change in the level of consciousness, there is drowsiness, confusion, difficulty in arousing, seizures, bleeding or watery discharge from the nose and ears, pupil, if they are slow to react or they are unequal, serious thing, blurred vision, loss of sensation to any extremity, slurred speech and vomiting. And that's it. That's my topic for today. I will be unmuting. Uh, I'm only the host, so I have to unmute her one by one or the moderators.
Uh, thank you, Sumit. This was a really nice talk. And uh, uh, before you get to other people's question, I have two questions for you. <laughs> So, uh, well, some of our things overlap, so and we get asked common questions. So, uh, one one question is you've already told us the red flags, what everyone should look out for. But very commonly, uh, in a more serious case, you will get a phone call either to you or even a family physician, like, uh, Doctor, my child is unconscious now. What should I do? I understand the obvious thing is yes, take to the hospital. But uh, as a specialist, what would be your recommendation as how they should handle the child? at home and from home till they are brought to the hospital, what is the right way to handle the child? I mean, that's a very good question, very pertinent one that I could not cover in this topic because uh, I think what you're pointing towards is a cervical spine injury that can very well be associated with this. Uh, it is very important if the child is unconscious, the level of care that we require is very, very different. You have to have the child flat on the surface. You have to see that the movement of the head, neck, shoulder is at the same time. They have to be like a robot. So ask them to wrap the child in a very thick uh, sheet at home. We don't expect to have them, them to have a stretcher or something like that, a hardboard at home. So a very thick bed sheet if you have and hold the child on that so that the neck, shoulder and the head move at the same time. If there is an associated cervical cord, uh, injury, we can protect them. Check for the breathing. Unfortunately, in India, not everyone has an access to 911 or there's no rapid paramedical services that we can get. Shift the child to the nearest hospital for first aid. Number one, number one remains number one, A, B, C. You protect the airway, breathing and circulation. And only after that, you think of the D, decompression and everything else, elevation. First thing has to be airway, breathing and circulation. If you get the child to our hospital, but you have lost the very valuable time of not providing the airway support at that time, everything is lost. So first take them to a hospital which has an ABC where you can just provide a first aid, give a compression of the wound if there is any wound, give a neck collar as soon as possible in the hospital. So these basic things need to be covered by all the nursing homes before they ship the child to a tertiary care center. Uh, thanks, Sumit. And one more, uh, one more question. Like since we know prevention is always better than cure and a child coming with such symptoms. So as parents or family physicians, what would be a basic advice that they could give uh, their patients? Like in general, what could be the preventive measures that they can take so that their child doesn't get into such trouble? So uh, you can't ask the children not to run around. It's a very unfair thing to tell the child. Uh, we have children at home and we can't tell them not to run around. All we can do is like, you know, suppose accidental falls. You have to make your house child proof. There cannot be any sharp edges to the furniture. You have to, it's very easily available on Amazon. If you go to see at 200, 300 rupees, you get some 12 nice covers that you can put on your furniture. You stick it on them and the, it becomes very smooth surface. Adapt. So even if the child comes and bangs on it, he'll not have any depressed fracture. A small bump is fine. We have all had bumps. Uh, second thing is like, you know, height management. Suppose how tall the child can have access to. If you have a very tall cupboard, but there's easily child can climb onto it. You are inviting trouble, nothing else. When you teach children cycling, uh, I don't think any of us, Avi, you or me have ever used a cycling helmet, but we must use, we need to teach these children because now the cycles are better. Other vehicles are faster. When I used to cycle when I was a small child, I was the only one on the road who was cycling. Now there are hundred vehicles who are driving at a very, very crazy speed and you need to protect from that also. So a helmet, a nice elbow padding and knee padding for uh, anything else. And these are very essential things while they're playing in the sport to give them appropriate gear and to make it compulsory. Child seats in the cars. Abroad, if you have a child delivered, you cannot take the wife and the kid home unless you have a car seat in your car. In your car. In India, nothing like that. We just, our arms and our laps are the child seat and we just hold the child happily and that's, our, that's what we accept and that's what is norm. We need to change these things. Government need to take be proactive about this so that uh, we have to make everything very, very child friendly. Thanks. Thank you, Sumita. We have a couple of questions in uh, the chat box. So first is by Dr. Nagwekar. She's asking uh, in private practice, uh, as such, uh, how many uh, cases of uh, NIA or abuse uh, that uh, do you see? And in general, when would you suspect NIA uh, in your clinical practice? There is no age group that is restricted uh, to have an abusive uh, uh, child uh, handling. Uh, see what happens that any age group right now, everyone is very frustrated. Children at home, people are at home. These are the times they have proven that the abusive cases increase 
because everybody is full of energy and at home only the children get fidgety irritable and they are troubling the parents with the work and all they tend to get abusive ek hat phatka maar liya chalta hai is a kind of attitude that is accepted in norms in our indian scenario but when you see as a general practitioner that patient has come to you with multiple injuries they appear scared to be in front of the parents there the history is very murky every single time he had a fall he had a fall but suppose he had a fall but he is having a like you know an arm you can see a mark on the arm so these are not on the forearm so like you know you typically know when a person has a fall they will extend their forearm and not their arm so these and multiple duration of injury so one injury is healing second is a fresh injury third is another fresh injury is coming up there is a healed fracture uh, rib fractures Healed fractures. These are very typical signs of an abusive uh, injury. Somehow they are not so. I would. They say it is very less in India. I would say they are less reported in India. Uh, lovely. Uh, some more questions. Uh, you spoke about the ETV and the Omega procedures. So uh, 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 the audience is asking, like in general, uh, uh, with these procedures, what is the risk of uh, infection? Is it like fifty percent higher? Oh no no no! Infection would be fifty percent. I would be the infection committee would be sitting on my head. It is hardly <laughs> about two to three uh, percent. The suppose I have put an uh, 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 an uh, external ventricular drain. That is a continuous drainage that we have put. If within five days we have to remove it, the upper limit is five days. If you are able to remove within five days, the chance of infection is about five percent. Every single day of more we are keeping the ETV, the chance goes up exponentially. So five days is a limit for any ETV. But if I put an Omega reservoir, in that case, I, there is no limit how much I can keep the ETV. I can just keep on changing my scalp in and uh, changing the system after every five days, and there is no limit how much we can have. They have had an ETV of more than thirty-five centimeter and exit from here. There is a zero percent infection rate. it's different as per different procedures now etv has extremely etv has extremely low infection rate but low success rate actually so infection rate is not so high all right uh then uh, dr suresh rao wants to know that uh, if a child uh, uh, is with uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, head injury if there's an association uh, how would your approach i mean what would be your approach watchful observation is what we'll be looking for i understand sir's question because we used to get some head injuries during time of dengue and all and the count is very very low uh, we all protocols say we do not start empirically platelets we involve a pediatric uh, hematologist which is why this kind of setup works for us we involve a hematologist who is keeping a tab on everything be very very watchful for the gcs and early charting of gcs pupillary response movement and everything like we have in our icu you have seen that is very very essential so that we pick up any drop in the sensory or any increase in the bleed at the earliest scan the patient appropriate correction is given and then we can take it forward we don't do anything preemptively just because the child has thrombocytopenia but be watchful and uh, one more question is uh, is there a indication for uh, anti convulsant uh, therapy post injury and if at all do you give uh, what is the course and how many days so there are multiple studies that have been done on this we generally do not start anti convulsants after a head injury uh, very very rarely if i am like very sure patient has had a seizure then of course you must start at least for 3 months we have to give it in a post seizure prophylaxis the uk study says 3 months 2 to 3 months we must give in case there is a seizure uh, but otherwise generally we don't start the anti convulsant therapy immediately after any kind of injury there is a intraparenchymal bleed then that's a very different scenario that we're looking at but a normal head injury with even pedicle hemorrhage or small hemorrhage we explain the child uh, or the parents the risk of getting a seizure and maybe a need to start anti convulsant but don't start it right away just as a prevention uh dr sumit i'll i like to add a point to that for post traumatic seizures so uh yeah if you have a seizure or you have like you undergone a surgery or or, or you know could parietal contusions penetrating injury you may start but uh, the drug of choice should be phenytoin or levetiracetam there is insufficient evidence for valproate or carbamazepine or other drugs yeah um and in fact no uh, evidence of starting anything for mild and moderate traumatic brain injury right we never start we always mm. never start mm. so that mm. but some centers they start and they send to us then it's difficult for us to stop it <laughs> sure yeah, yeah. Uh, other things so within uh, in adults they talk about the golden hour for the heart in adults head injury also they sometimes talk about the golden hour period that the patient should be brought in 
for pediatric patients with similar injuries uh, is there any recommendation or are there any guidelines such no we have to decide as per the severity only i would say in uh, in, in our kind of setup we don't have that golden hour uh, we don't have luxury of having a 911 or a ambulance or a green quarter when patient can come to our setup very early i would say send them to a primary center to get the first aid first first things first abc and then we can send the child to us with a nice cervical collar if suppose child is in nala sopra and going to come over here and he is having his head uh, you know sideways moving in a taxi or in an ambulance the entire way it's not a very nice thing to have yes first a doctor should see over there a general practitioner should see over there see the airway breathing and circulation stabilize the child stabilize the cervical spine and then if they send to us it's a much better thing there is no golden hour as such because we are not trying to intervene immediately in most of the kids the intervention part is very 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 small percentage of the entire spectrum i absolutely agree with you because we see a lot of parents they get worried and just grab a hold of their child in the car and just rush and then so I more mean, problems than good absolutely. that causes more problems so excellent points um dr sumit i had a question um how commonly do you see post concussion syndrome here um like in the west a ton of them mostly sports injury related concussions and you know post concussion syndrome um what's been your I experience think, with that i think we have a very high level of acceptance for post concussion syndrome hardly ever we have seen any case but all the discussion that we see in the western world are about the post yeah. concussion syndrome how they should not be playing sport for like 15 days and this and that In India, we accept it very easily that he had an injury. He was days for a day. And now he's all fine and he's going to school and playing again. But if you have a child with a concussion, if the child is appearing dazed, if he had a head injury, any mode of injury, and he was confused, even for some amount of time, we advise and we must advise the next fifteen days avoid all contact sport, avoid all physical activity that is going to induce uh, a head injury like scenario again. Of it doesn't mean you keep him at home. but just be careful that's all we can advise but somehow it is very uncommon in indian scenario the, the, right. uh, i'd like to make a point here that is because the indian <laughs> sports are completely different uh, yeah. in us they play american football and such sports mm-hmm. where the concussion are more common uh, most indian children don't like fighting they sit at <laughs> home or play cricket or maximum football that is their limit so there are or, or <laughs> ps4 or uh, yes so there is a very uh, less chance of getting a concussion is unless they are practicing wwe type moves at home with their siblings or something like that right. and, then, and i think I, yeah if you go to see is like suppose now we don't have two people who are going to come and have a head on collision like the american soccer or the rugby in india we have more like kabaddi like sport is more common so people are standing and other person is going to sneak in on the body to body contact and try to make him fall down so it's more like a judo like activity rather than a, you know karate like where you are hitting directly to each other i think that could be one of the bigger causes and i think we are as a population as a culture we are very we are little more stoic you know so any uh, like post concussion syndrome can have significant personality changes behavior uh, problems with focus and balance uh, i think a lot of these are swept under the carpet and attributed to other things so i think just being sensitive to less you can have certain changes after a concussion or after a seemingly okay head injury i think is important you should i think everybody should bring it to the uh, attention of the doctor yeah We, I think. Do we have any more questions? Uh, I think we have one. Question: How do you treat uh, caput post delivery? Very, very important question that sir has asked over here. Uh, we have a watchful observation for a caput. You don't need to don't need to do anything actively for this caput unless it's a it's a shock or if the this caput undergoes calcification or this is a bone resorption. Uh, so acute in acute management is just watchful observation again for caput. believe me in periodic head injury watchful observation is the best part that a neurosurgeon can do as uh, we need to have a child to a pediatrician or a pediatric setter but intervention not is not always good in these cases very rarely we require to open them very regularly if there is a kefal hematoma uh, then we need to do something for caput usually we just observe and they are all right on their own yeah i will like to contribute on that caput part generally like what dr sumit pawar said we don't do anything very rarely it gets infected and then you may need to drain it can give rise to indirect hyperbilirubinemia sometimes and uh, uh, so indirect jaundice it can give rise to 
and uh, uh, then they may need treatment for that in the form of phototherapy or other thing. But caput or cephalematoma per se, we don't do anything. Yeah, please. Very nice, professor. Very nice summary of the whole situation. Uh, other thing, we don't have questions. One last question I'll just ask. Uh, this is, uh, we've till now we've been talking to uh, relatively normally developing children with all of these things. We have a lot of uh, family physicians and families who have children with uh, syndrome, cerebral palsy and other such neuromuscular uh, conditions. So in them, uh, uh, the GCS and things are not so easy as you mentioned. So anything like if a family calls them and they have a, a disabled or a special child, any, in, uh, any advice of how they can help pick up so that they can pick it up at the right time and send to the right person? Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Abhi, uh, because uh, this is a very special case where Pooja has put me into trouble many, many times when she has a abnormal child and they have a head injury. It's very difficult to make out whether this is how they were or this is a new finding. So your parent at that time is your best scan, the parent. You have to keep on asking the parent, is this how he normally behaves? We always do a CT scan in such kind of injury because we cannot make out, we cannot be really sure whether that's what I had mentioned in non-accidental trauma or non-routine trauma. So we are not really sure in these kids what they are behaving, could be masking, could be, we just don't know exactly. Better you get a scan done so you have a baseline. If there is any worsening from that point of view, from that point onwards, then we can see. Second thing, this is a confusion from mild to moderate. From moderate to severe, there's a loss of consciousness and everything that's very, very clear to understand the pupillary changes are going to be at the same time. If there's any weakness that's going to come at the same time. So at that time, we can be observant. Uh, we don't need to be really worried. From mild to moderate, uh, the parent has to tell, is this how he normally is? Or is there uh, something different or something additional? And parents somehow in this case are very, very vigilant. They know they can pick up every single thing what is different from the normal routine things. But yes, scan immediately, 100% scan immediately and ask the parent to keep the observation. And you note at that time, this is how the child normally is. And any drop from here, then you can take over. Thank you so much, Sumit. Thank you. I, I don't think we have any more questions. Is there anyone else who would like to ask something? Uh, no, so I think we don't, we don't have any more questions. So uh, we can move ahead with the next uh, talk. Thank you so much, uh, Sumit. And uh, you, you passed on some great information uh, for everyone. So, uh, I'll introduce our next speaker once again. We have uh, Dr. Ruchi Pari. Uh, she's a very uh, experienced and very well-trained uh, pediatric endocrinologist. And she's also a part of our obesity clinic and uh, is uh, well-versed in treating basically all uh, endocrinopathies which, uh, do, uh, which, are, uh, which come to us. And she's a, uh, basically most of our pediatric ortho and conditions, we always need a help for something or the other, and she's always there for us. So I'd like to welcome her and she can, you can share your screen and then she'll talk to us about uh, stature, what is uh, normal and what is abnormal. Um, thank you, Avi, for those kind words. Um, after two fantastic talks, I hope I'm able to sustain your interest and your attention. Uh, so why stature is a topic for today? So the most common endocrine referrals are related to growth, and out of that, short stature is the most common thing, and hence the topic of discussion today. So the overview for this whole discussion would include what is normal growth, what happens in a child throughout the childhood and adolescence, which would say it's normal? How do we differentiate abnormal from normal? And then on what basis do we assess this growth and interpret it? And hence, how will we then evaluate what is the etiological diagnosis based on clinical and investigative approach? So does the stature or height matter? Yes, it does. If, as you can see in the image, there are two people. One is short, who's looking with awe and jealousy at a very tall person. But if you see this tall person, he's holding a stick. So yes, stature does matter. 
some stature is good some stature is not bad and to whom i guess to everyone right to every common person to every person who's existing in this world it matters if you guess this picture this is of lionel messi he is a football player who was born in argentina and he had to move to barcelona and adapt that team because he got diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency at 10 years of age and being the shortest player he had to support himself financially for this growth hormone to continue his sport activities and hence that's how the spain and the barcelona team accepted him so yes the stature or the linear height does matter so what are the most common scenarios that we see in our opd practice as a physician as a pediatrician or as a pediatric endocrinologist doctor my daughter has got her menses what do you th uh, we think that she will remain short can we give her injection growth hormone now the second scenario that we face my child has always been short his change he changes his shoe size once in 2 to 3 years but we are also average in height and we have read that eventually they do grow and catch up later so should we wait the third scenario doctor we are short parents we don't want our child to be short as well we are here well in time can we do something about his growth we've made sure that he's hanging on bars and he goes for swimming regularly the fourth scenario my child is 13 years 6 months he was comparable to his peers but now the peers have outgrown them and they have achieved good height and we feel that the child is still looking shorter as compared to them is there any problem do we need any treatment for this child and the last scenario my son is 16 years old he shaves on a regular interval before he reaches 18 years as we know that the height grows till 18 years can we give him injection growth hormone and optimize his height so to understand whether these scenarios need any treatment or referral let's go to the first topic of our overview which is normal growth so growth is the most fundamental characteristic of childhood it is an indicator of mental and physical health any healthy child would have a predicted growth rate and velocity so if there is any problem with health then this would deviate from normal the growth factors the factors which affect the growth include multi, multi multitude so these are genetic factors we all know that we follow a familial pattern okay we also know that in a in a country like india there are differences in the height we know that the north east people will go grow differently than the northern people which will grow differently than the southern people so yes ethnicity and race does matter australian and and european have the highest height as compared to the asians nutrition yes it starts right from the maternal nutrition when the mother is pregnant we all make sure that she has been having enough nutrition so that the fetus grows well and hence after that the newborn and and thereafter we also need to make sure that all the functions of the body are in harmony anything that affects these systems can also affect growth psychosocial factor i think this is a most ignored factor so if we have twins and if they are grown in a different environment one who is deprived and one who is well nourished even though they were twins to bond to a same biological parents they will still have different growth patterns and the one who's in a deprived situation will be affected in growth chromosomal disorders we know down syndrome most common they they do have affection in height as well as their mental uh, uh, subnormality infections tuberculosis if it's a disseminated or it's 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 a multi drug resistant uh, tuberculosis which goes on for a long time which requires multitude of drugs it does affect growth maternal illness as we said yes right from pregnancy any illness that the mother has right from her childhood or something that has happened pregnancy related re related to sugars or glucose or calcium or anemia can affect the fetus growth and hence the newborn birth weight does matter okay because the birth weight decides what environment this child was growing in in the in the womb and also how it's going to respond to the external environment and last comes the hormones and that's my role and the most important hormones which maintains normal growth are growth hormone thyroid hormones and to maintain a normal puberty and hence at growth and growth at that time other sex hormones so after this interaction it is important that how do we know that this child is short so it's important to assess this child this children as a routine part of healthcare this will help to detect diag uh, and diagnose diseases at an early age it will also help to differentiate between a recurrent versus a persistent a chronic illness and this will also help us in timing the duration of the onset of this illness 
we may not be able to uh, interfere or intervene at one growth point so it's always important that the children are seen at at different periods of growth and they are charted on the growth chart because this will also help us in knowing that they were well before but something has occurred some event has occurred which has now affected their growth and eventually may not reach up to the adulthood so after knowing that how important is growth for any child and an adolescent let's know what are the important growth points intrauterine growth is the most rapid period of growth in individual it slows down in throughout the first two years of life weight can come down by 30% of first year and length by 50% of the first year next period would be a mild mid childhood spurt okay and after that would be the adolescent spurt which we all know where girls attend puberty before boys and hence they have a pubertal spurt earlier than the boys what are the phases of growth does all the elements of the of these factors that we just went through affect every every part of childhood and adolescence no it's different including even the hormones so in a fetus the most important hormones are insulin like growth factor and insulin so even if you have a growth hormone deficient child or a thyroid deficiency you may not be able to pick them up at birth because that's not what manages the fetus growth the maximum height velocity in fetus you see it in second gestation and and the maximum weight velocity you see it in the third trimester so obviously when a preterm child is born it has definitely an affection to growth in infancy the most important thing is genetic that is the familial growth and the nutrition and thereafter comes the hormones which are growth hormone thyroid hormone besides the genetic and the nutrition in puberty gonadal steroids besides growth hormone and thyroid hormone plays an important role besides besides the 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 growth hormone the the pubertal spurt is also given by the gonadal steroids so if we have adequate growth hormone but not adequate gonadal steroids there will be problem with puberty and hence height velocity and hence the adult stature so then what is abnormal in this session we are going to cover the the stature which has which is short and we are not going to look at the tall stature because short stature is the most common presentation of children and referred commonly to endocrinologist so let's go to one clinical case and let's see if we can evaluate and come to a conclusion there's a 10 year old male who was born of non consanguineous marriage second by order of birth and the complaint given by parents is the child is not gaining height and having constipation there is some febrile conversions in the past history but the birth history looks essentially normal with a birth, birth weight of 2.8 kilos though there is a significant family history where they say that the mother and the maternal grandmother are short and the father had an onset of puberty which was delayed around 18 years however this child has been growing well and developing well uh, the child has been developing well but not been grow growing well on examination we have certain growth points where weight is 18 kilo and height is 108 cm an examination just reveals pallor and everything else is normal based on this history do we even know whether this child is short and if this child is short what would would be the di diagnosis of this child maybe with this whole prolonged and and very uh, detailed history we could come to a lot of differential diagnosis yes you can look at that person who's so fab uh, who's so fab uh, fab fabled who doesn't know what is the diagnosis we can't give all four diagnoses to a child so what is it that we are missing from this clinical evaluation so first is what is short we should know what is short and what is not short so definition of short stature is always based on a growth chart okay so if the height is below a third centile or less than stand two standard deviations below the mean or the average height for that age and gender according to the population standard or if the height is within the normal centiles but excessively short for mid parental or the type target height or if the height is within the normal centiles for national and parental growths but the growth velocity or the rate of growth is consistently below the 25th centile when measured over 6 to 12 months or if the child is growing and crossing the two major percentile lines without even uh, abiding to the above three conditions so what how do we confirm this you know first is we need to measure this child for measuring the child we need to have the accurate equipments besides measuring the child we also need to measure the parents after that we need to plot this height and weight on accurate growth chart so as it was mentioned it has to be 
population based growth chart so if we if we plot these children on a us or a uk or a european based growth charts we will not be doing justice to this child because these children may look much shorter than what they actually are or even a obese indian child would be looking as uh, normal or underweight on those charts so it's important that we follow ethnicity and population based charts which in 2015 the indian academy of pediatrics has released a charts for children between 0 to 5 years and between 0 to 18 years so that brings us to the next session of this topic which is how do we assess growth and how do we interpret it by plotting it on the growth charts so the growth assessment the most common parameters that we do see in our common practice is weight and height so height is a linear height and length is something that you see in a supine position for an infant so there are many more if you can see this slide which i have uh, kind of dimmed it there are many more growth parameters that you you may see but the most important that you can see and make sure that it's always there on the on the prescription of the children is weight and length or height depending upon the age besides the growth it's important how these children have matured so we need to look at the dentition of the child for any child about 6 years of age it is important that we look for the pubertal or the sex sexual maturity assessment and after that the skeletal maturation so how do we measure weight it's it's important that we have a correct weighing scale the bathroom scales which 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 move a lot are not accurate and they may not give you the accurate measurement so electronic scales are always the correct scales to measure okay and for the height there are two kinds of uh, measurement uh, equipments that's available to us one is a stadiometer as you can see here which is which is mounted on the wall or there is a stretchometer which we can just screw it on any of a wall which is straight and we can pull it down to see what the height of the child is that that is the equipment but it is also important how we assess this height because if we have any any uh, inaccurate measurements we will not be able to know whether this child is growing well or not so make sure that whenever you are measuring the child the the shoes the socks the bands the clips are all out okay the child is standing with the the uh, the knee the calf the heels the scapula and the occiput which is against the wall and we make sure that we we stabilize the mastoid so the uh, the uh, outer margin of the eyes is is joining the external auditory meatus and it is parallel to the ground or perpendicular to the stadiometer and after stabilizing we make sure that the child is not raising the heel or not bending the knees the stadium meter always has a head end which is flexible and movable sometimes for a small child you may need two people otherwise one person is enough to measure the height whereas in an infant less than 2 years who cannot stand still we need to measure by an infantometer which is a wooden uh, infantometer where the head end is fixed but the foot end is movable you will definitely need two people where one fixes the uh, the head making sure that that the the plane that we just uh, discussed the the margin that is the lower uh, uh, the lower eye margin is joining the external auditory meatus and that is uh, perpendicular to the ground level while positioning the legs we have to make sure the knees are not bent and the foot is aligning to this footboard okay if the child is stretching out and and pointing out to the toes then we may get an erroneous Uh, measurement so make sure that this is the kind of measurement that you take an, on an infantometer infantometer for any child who is less than 2 years now when we go from the length to the height there is always a difference that is because the spine is always more fully stretched in supine position and there's a difference of almost 0.7 to 1 cm between the recommended length and the height and hence we need to always make sure that when we go on to the height for the first time we may not find it accurate but then from then onwards we can look at the trend so then what are the normal height in these children to have an average idea about how these children are growing uh, based on one growth point this is what we know of at birth generally the children are between 50 to 55 cm in length they grow by about 25 cm in the first year and the the height or the length is about 75 cm at one year of age after that they grow by 12 cm at four years the any child is above 100 cm then they grow at, at an average of 5 to 6 cm per year depending it doesn't depend whether the child is boy or a girl it's same for any gender but at puberty it changes because the growth spurts for girls is 7 to 9 cm whereas for boys is 9 to 11 cm and this occurs over 2 to 3 years 
what is normal for the weight so on an average a term child has a weight of 2.5 to 3 kilos then they gain about 200 grams per work in in per week in first 3 months followed by 150 gram per week in second 3 months and then 100 gram per week in the third 3 months and last in in the last 3 months of the first year they gain by 50 gram per week so that's how we take it as an average that a child who's born term of adequate weight should triple by about 1 year of age in up to 6 years from from 1 to 6 years they grow by 2 kilos in a year and between 6 to 10 years they grow by 3 kilos per year so if you want to add another growth parameter besides the stature it's the upper segment to lower segment this tells us whether there is any affection of the spine or the limbs which is causing problems with the growth in an infant we measure the infant uh, crown rump length instead of the the lower segment that we do it in the children so in children where the lower segment is measured from the pubic symphysis to the ground level and this is subtracted from the height which will give you an upper segment and then we take the ratio of upper segment to lower segment whereas in infant we take the upper segment on an infantometer and subtract that from the length and then have a ratio of upper segment to lower segment so at birth the normal ratio is 1.7 which becomes 1 at between 7 to 10 years and after completion of puberty it is remains below 1 this is the normal reference ranges for the upper segment to lower segment ratios so once we have got an assessment of growth we need to know whether this growth parameter is normal or abnormal so for that we need to plot it on the growth chart which are the accurate ethnicity and population based growth charts and these are the inter, uh, the growth charts which has been released by indian academy of pediatrics uh, published by dr khadelkar in 2015 where the blue chart is for boys and the pink chart is for the girls this is a chart for 0 to 18 years the x axis has the the age in years and the y axis has the parameters for weight and height in kilos and in centimeters so the ones that you see on the top where a square mark these are the centiles these are the centile charts that we were talking about in growth in in short stature these are the centile lines for height and these are the centile lines for the weight so all these centile lines for height or weight are seven okay so the average is the 50th centile and the lowest is the 3rd centile and the highest is the 97th centile so for any child to say that it, it's he or she is short he should be shorter than the 3rd centile so this is the 3rd centile which is red mark for boys and this is the 3rd centile which is red mark for girls but also we saw this is the charts that we we use it for 0 to 5 years which has been released by who in 2006 where india was also one of the country where the data was collected and hence here what we see that the length is seen in combination with head circumference and with the weight as we saw in the short stature that if the child is normal for the centile on the growth chart we need to compare it with the family height so the family height for boys and girls differs okay so for boys it is the father's height plus mother's height plus 13 divided by 2 whereas in girls it is minus 13 divided by 2 this difference is because the adult difference that we have between these two genders as they have a different kind of a pubertal growth spurt so any target that we see for a mid parental height range it has to be below and above two standard deviation and we plot that on the 18 years and we plot it as a range above the mid parental height by 6 cm and below the mid parental height by 6 cm so to understand that let let us take one example this is a child who is who has a uh, whose father's height is 163 cm mother's height is 154 cm and since it's a girl we are going to subtract 13 from the addition of mother's and father's height and divide by 2 so the target height is 152 cm we're going to plot that on the 18th the age the line of the 18th year so the the mid parental height is 152 cm and then we plot the range above and below by 6 cm so the point here which is already there shows that the child is on the lower centile but is okay for the mid parental height so definitely this child when we look for the mid parental height looks okay second example this child is definitely okay for the for the centile because he's on the she's on the average and also is on within the mid parental height so is okay for both the definitions but when we look at this child this child is below the third centile and also the mid, below the mid parental height or below the two standard deviation of the 
target height of 152 centimeters. So definitely this child needs investigation and this child needs observation. So the third criteria was to look at a growth velocity or the growth rate. And there we mentioned that we had need to look at a 25th centile, whereas in the growth, we were in the height centile, we were looking at the third percentile. And the reason for this is that the third centile on the height is approximately 25th centile on the growth velocity chart. So this is the growth velocity chart where this is the 25th centile. And any child who is growing below this, we would say that the growth rate is poor and hence the child would eventually cross the centiles and will not uh, achieve the adult stature that the child is supposed to achieve. So why is this growth uh, trend or growth rate important? If we had at one point child A and child B, we would have said that child B is abnormal. But after looking at a period of time that's almost one and a half years, we see that the child B is growing fine and parallel to this, this centile. So the growth velocity is okay. Maybe this is a child who's, who is born to a, a, a short parent and probably having familial short stature. But this child A, who looked okay at first point, after one and a half years has crossed over to centiles and is now meeting child B. So this is this is deceleration of growth. This is affection of growth rate and this is crossing of growth centiles and definition, definitely this child needs evaluation for growth and this child just needs observation. Also, there is another parameter that we look at is how is this child growing? So what is the age at which the child is having an height which is an average? So if this is a girl who is five years, four months with a height of 96 centimeter plotted over here, what is the height age or what is the average uh, at which the height matches the 50th centile? And that is three years, four months. So the child is running behind the age by almost two years and definitely there is some issue over here, but what is missing over here is the mid-parental height. So we definitely need to look at the mid-parental height as well. We know that in a very busy practice, all this becomes really difficult to get a height, to plot a height, and then to interpret a height. So our life has been made easy by technology. And this is a growth IAP growth chart app, which can be downloaded from the Play Store or from the Apple Store. OK, this is how the icon looks. It takes less than a one minute to have the growth chart in, in this kind of an app. Just go and put in whether this is a new patient or an existing patient. Put in the details, I've already put in the details for a, for a child. And this is what the outcome has come in less than a minute. It's in few seconds that you will get all the growth charts of this child. So this child's mid-parental height is very good, but the child is growing over here, which is not below the third centile, but definitely below the two standard deviation of the mid-parental height. Though the growth velocity is good, we just need, we need to make sure that the child needs to be observed. So in this app, you can always you can also save and have a trend of this. This app can also be saved by the mother or the father. So it's ne it's not necessary that it's only stored in the doctor's uh, mobile. You can also have the parents tracking this height. With technology and with teleconsultations nowadays, we've been teaching parents how to take the height so they can then measure it then henceforward. And they can also come up when, when they see that the growth velocity or the growth trend is going downward and the child needs attention. It also gives you a BMI chart. It also gives you a weight for age chart. This was less than five years. There are also WHO charts which can help us to know what is the uh, height, weight, and uh, head for this child. So there is no excuse. Us. Next that we need in growth is the maturation. And the most important maturation in children is puberty. As we know that all children don't have the same age of onset chronological or the birth age, it correlates more with the skeletal maturation. So for girls, the onset could be anywhere between 8 to 13 years. Usually the onset is manifested by thalarchy or the breast bud, and then the sequence is as pubarchy and menarchy. Whereas in boys, the onset is between 9 and 14 years, and the onset of puberty is how it is measured with Prader's orchidometer, where you can see that the green beads are pre-pubertal and starting from 4 ml onwards are pubertal and this can help us to stage whether the puberty is, is progressing towards the adult measurement. This sequence is then followed by pubarchy and sper spermachy. 
So then when do they have the growth spurt in the sequence of puberty? So in boys, they start with the onset of testicular growth, then they have an acceleration of growth. And before they have the onset of facial hair, so before they start shaving and they have a voice change, they achieve a pubertal spurt, which is nine to 11 centimeter per year for almost two to three years. And after they have achieved facial hair, there is a deceleration of growth and almost stoppage of growth. In boys, because of the secular trend, that the trend of improving nutrition, improving economy, now no one grows till 18 years. At an average, the boys would finish their growth between 14 to 16 years. Whereas in girls, the onset is marked by the thalarchy. There is an acceleration of growth. And before the onset of menarche, the children, the girls will have a pubertal spurt, which is seven to nine centimeter per year, which will go on for two to three years. And after the onset of menarche, these girls have a deceleration of growth and almost between 12 to 14 years on an average, these, should, these girls finish their growth trend and the growth that is remaining after the onset of menarche is just about five to six centimeter. So if any child who is short and needs any help should be before they finish or they have complete a fusion of epiphysis, otherwise there will be no help and these will remain short even though we could have helped them earlier. So when do we monitor these children? It's not possible to monitor at every visit of sickness that the child comes in. So it's better to monitor when the child is healthy. So immunization contacts are best utilized to measure growth and development. You can take one more measurement at six months of age between birth to three years. Between four to eight years, it's, it's, it's required to measure six monthly and the SMR staging or the sexual mature, maturity reading should start after six years of age. And in older children between 9 to 18 years, it's important to analyze every year the height, weight, also add on to body mass index and blood pressure besides the pubertal assessment. So now we go to evaluation of what is short and how do we approach it. So then what are the causes of short stage? So the short stage is divided into normal variants, which are physiological short stage. This is further divided into either familial short stature or constitutional delay of growth and puberty. In familial short stature, there will be a history of parents being short, but not growth hormone deficient. So these are short parents who have who are having normal growth velocity during their childhood, who had no chronic systemic illness then and have achieved their height. Okay, these the children of these parents will also grow and follow a centile. They will not have deceleration of growth or crossing of centile. They will follow the midparental height range. The growth rate and velocity will be normal. The skeletal maturity will be normal, and they will have a on, normal onset of growth and puberty. So basically, this is a normal variant, looking short but not short for uh, evaluation. In children with constitutional delay, these are the children who are born normal, who grow normally till two years of age, and then they kind of decelerate and follow a certain centile parallel and have a normal growth velocity after that. But they have delayed onset of puberty, and hence they grow longer than the average boys or girls, and hence they catch up to the adult stature. So hence, the adult stature and familial short stature and constitutional delay will remain normal. They have no problems with the growth rate or puberty, though in constitutional delay, there will be a delayed onset of puberty, but they will progress and eventually catch up with the peers and have an adult uh, on stature, which is uh, comparable to the family. So then what are the pathological growth problems? So we have a mnemonic, which is called endocrine picnics, where the endocrine causes are growth hormone deficiency, hypothyroidism, rickets or Cushing syndrome where there's increased leukocorticoid. And picnic is a mnemonic that we use for non-endocrine causes of short stature. As we discussed, environment plays an important role. So a psychosocial dwarfism where they are deprived of the environment and of the social care. When they are removed from this environment and kept in a better environment, they will start growing and doing well. So it's just not nourishment that is a problem. It is also the mental health and the social environment that they are growing in. Hydrogenic, we know if there is any topical or oral uh, prolonged glucocorticoids, it can cause short stature. Any systemic illness which is ongoing for a long time, as Dr. Vibor mentioned, jaundice which is ongoing for a long time, or there's anything to do with the respiratory like cystic fibrosis, or there's anything to do with kidneys, where there is uh, chronic kidney uh, for problem, then this all will affect the growth. Nutritional. So if the nutrition is not adequate, it will definitely affect the uh, weight first and, and, and eventually the height. 
also the birth at birth if the child's uh, uh, nutrition was not okay and the child was born low birth weight or short small for gestational age this could then 10% uh, of these children may not catch up to to normal peer growth and they may require help chromosomal most common is the downs in girls we see turner syndrome turner syndrome is one where there's a deletion of x chromosome where these children have an affected growth and puberty the others will be uh, in besides the down syndrome we have other syndromes that, such as russell silver syndrome nonan syndrome sekel syndrome we'll see eventually how these children look like and skeletal dysplasia where there is an abnormality with the bone development where there could be an affection of the spine which will affect the trunk or there will be an affection of the limbs and which these are all the developmental problems and they are the permanent problems so we need to distinguish this from the problems where we can do something for the children in terms of treatment the last aspect is the idiopathic short station so these are the children who are short for the population who are short for the mid parental height who are not having adequate growth velocity and their evaluation shows nothing of these endocrine pictures so these are idiopathic short stature where there may be some genetic problem which we are yet to uh, identify and these children may need help and growth hormone can even help these children so how do we identify short stature as we saw first we need to know whether the child is short we need to differentiate this short stature from a normal variant and then go on to historical clinical and evaluation based on anthropometry so the clinical clues that you will have on history always important that we look at the previous records which will help us to know the growth records or the growth velocity we should know whether there is any any uh, feature suggestive of chronic systemic illness that if there was any prolonged jaundice or there is any polyuria or there is any any malnourishment so dietary history will play an important role past history if there was a significant head injury as as was was mentioned by dr sumit so if there is a significant uh, head injury then it can affect the pituitary stalk which can then affect the growth or if there was any irradiation because of any tumor or there was any infection to the brain this can affect growth eventually by affecting the pituitary birth history as we have al already discussed it's very important but also the mode of delivery as it was mentioned breech delivery can uh, can be um, uh, can be due to uh, an uh, an injured delivery so breech can be either an effect of a stock problem or a stock problem can lead to a breech so breech not every individual with breech but a breech individual with a short uh, stature should be evaluated for pituitary stock it's important to look into the family history based on the height and the puberty there are some inherited disorders so it's important to look at the consanguinity milestones will be very important especially in evaluation for hypothyroidism or any chronic systemic illness medications as we have discussed and the psycho psychosocial environment on examination we should always remember the vitals are very important they can give a very important clue including the respiratory rate hypertension anemia rickets and body proportion so if there is a problem with upper segment to lower segment and it does not match the age related reference then there is a disproportionate body proportion and it could lead could be because of skeletal dysplasia or an undiagnosed rickets or hypothyroidism it's always important to compare weight and height because where the weight is more affected it's it's we are looking at malnutrition and chronic systemic illness but where height is more affected then the uh, sorry where the weight is uh, not affected and the height is affected then we are looking at endocrine causes so when there is more affection to the weight it's more likely to be a non endocrine etiology so looking at the growth chart after uh, assessing the height these are the different etiology that we can come down to so looking at the first growth chart the first uh, uh, growth uh, ray, uh, the centiles are of the stature and the one below that is of the weight if we see the child was growing fine and then it decelerated but is following a centile and then ultimately it caught up so this is a growth chart of a constitutional delay of growth and puberty a familiar short stature would always follow a centile and a target height and will achieve the adult stature the weight would still be normal in these normal variants of growth whereas in this third chart you see that the weight is more affected than the height so here we are looking at either a nutritional deficiency or a chronic systemic illness in the fourth chart we can see that the height is more affected and weight looks significantly okay as we compare to the height so this is where we are looking at an endocrine problem and in this child there was a growth hormone deficiency once the growth hormone was replaced the child caught up and was growing well where the height and weight are equally affected this is some kind of a syndromic problem that we are looking at and this chart is belonging to a girl with a 
Turner syndrome. So if we look at these children in our OPD, if children like this present to you, then you know that these are a sure shot indication for referral to specialists. So the first picture or the pictorial indication is towards congenital hypothyroidism where you can see macroglossia. You can see a very lethargic child. There are coarse features. You would see per persistent constipation or hyperbilirubinemia. And these are the children who are missed on newborn screening. Otherwise, we should not be seeing these children anymore. The second and third are the disproportionate short stature. So the second picture is showing a short trunk. So there's problem with the spine or it could be muc mucoperisaccharidosis. Or, and the third picture, there is a problem with these limbs. If you compare the limbs in both the pictures, you see that these limbs are much shorter than this child. And this is the affection of the limbs and this could be achondroplasia. Okay, looking at the fourth, this is a child who has rickets but has not responded to uh, the vitamin D supplements. So here we are looking at non-nutritional vitamin D deficiency or any resistant rickets and hence the child has affected growth. Pictorial five and six are almost similar, but the etiology is different. Pictorial five was an iatrogenic cause of Cushing's where the child was applying uh, some creams for nappy rash and those were uh, containing steroids, almost 30 to 35 tubes were applied. Okay, so we need to make sure that uh, over the counter preparation is always uh, included in our history. And this boy is also Cushing's. If you can see, there is mooning of face. There is, uh, her, there is her hypertrichosis. There is acne. There is also buffalo hump. And this is a child who has, who has pituitary macroadenoma. So this is an endogenous cause of leukocorticoid, whereas this is the exogenous cause of leukocorticoid. And the last picture is a sweet looking doll-like child, which is growth hormone deficiency, who, who is actually looking probably like a three or four year old, but this child was actually seven to eight years old. This are the, uh, the other syndromic uh, causes which needs a referral. So pictorial one is Russell Silver syndrome. These are the children who have triangular faces. They are SGR or IGR at birth. They may have hemihypertrophy and clinodactyly that is incurvature of the little finger. Picture two is another syndrome which is called as sickle syndrome. It is called as bird headed dwarfism where you see a, a beak like uh, nose in this child. The third one is a Noonan syndrome. It's, it's, it's Turner syndrome in boys, where you see that there is a, a great difference of the bridge of the nose. There's stosis, there is low set ears, there's a shield-shaped chest, there is webbing of the neck, but this is all seen in boys. So this is a genetic problem and it's, it's seen in Noonan syndrome. Fourth is Down syndrome. We all can recognize Down syndrome. Fifth is the uh, common uh, cause of short stature in girls, which is Turner syndrome because of the deletion of X chromosome where they come with short stature. They come with cubitus valgus. They could also have ptosis, webbing of neck and uh, uh, widely spaced nipples or shield uh, shaped chest. So in a child which, which does not give you any clinical clue through this history picture or the clinical or the presentation, then the first level of investigations would include anything that has to do with systems and nutrition. So you will look for the CBC, the complete liver function test, renal function test. You would look for a VBG, blood gas and electrolytes for any renal tubular acidosis. For rickets, you will look for calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase. Celiac, not very common on our side of the country, but very common on the northern side. So celiac should also be included in the, in the first level of screening. Thyroid function test uh, in children, uh, older children, they may not come with affection of growth, but if there is a family history, they could have affection of uh, thyroid function test. Karyotype in all girls who are short because we need to find out if they are Turner syndrome and eventually a bone age. Bone age tells us about the skeletal maturation and the appearance and the fusion of the epiphyses on the left hand. This tells us what will be the growth potential left in the child. This does not help us to identify the etiology, but at least it helps us to know that how delayed is the bone age. So if a bone age is delayed by more than two years of chronological age, then definitely we are looking at a problem in a child, which is most likely to be a chronic systemic illness or an endocrine problem. So from the history examination, we can either have get some clues and evaluate accordingly, or we can know that this is a familial uh, or a constitutional normal variant of short stage and just assure the parents. 
If we don't get any clinical clues, then we send the first level of investigation. And if this first level of investigation is normal, then it is time for you to refer to the specialist to do more specialized tests, which, which is related to growth hormone, pituitary, or genetic evaluation. But if everything of this comes normal, then we are dealing with the idiopathic etiology for short stature. So let's go back to the clinical case where we were uh, we we had no idea what the diagnosis of the child was. This was a ten year old male. We got some more history that the child had poor growth and pain while walking. Hence, the child was receiving some calcium and vitamin D and tonic uh, uh, preparations. The other history remained the same. When we looked at the growth points and we monitored on the growth chart, we found that the child was way below the third centile of the normal population and way below the mid parental height, even the lowermost centile. Thankfully, we also had some more growth points which showed where the child had started developing a problem. So you can see the child was okay around six months to one year of age and then he started decelerating on the growth chart. So this also tells us to time the problem. Here we can see that the height is actually belonging to a five year, six months old and a way to a five year old, though the child is 10 years uh, on, on the chronological age. On examination, the child was poorly nourished, had a pallor, and there was no other problems. So would we think this as a familial short stature or constitutional delay of growth and puberty now? Obviously not, not from the growth because it's definitely not a normal variant. There's definitely a pathology underlying. So the other three causes still remains in place. Investigation, the one that we did as a first level of investigation, we found that the bone age of this child was delayed. He's 10 years old and the bone age was eight years. But a celiac screen was positive. The child then underwent biopsy and which the histopathology also confirmed celiac disease for this child. This child was then put only on gluten-free diet. And as you see, the child started doing well for the weight and for the height. He started catching up on both weight and height. This child got lost to follow up. And eventually when the child came back to us after a couple of years, we found that weight was doing fine, but compared to the height, the height had almost stabilized. There was something wrong with this child. We were not, and the, they were very sure that the gluten-free diet was still ongoing. As we know that celiac is an autoimmune disease, we should not forget to evaluate for other autoimmune disease. And when we evaluated, we found that this child has Hash Hashimoto thyroiditis. So this is an endocrine problem which affected the height more than the weight. And once we started suppl supplementing this child with thyroxine, the height started catching up. We need to still see that whether the child has a normal onset of puberty and he catches up to his adult stature. So the case scenarios, which with, with what we begin, uh, we had started this uh, session and commonly seen in our practice, the first one, doctor, my doc daughter has got her menses and we think she will remain short. Can we give injection growth hormone as we saw that before menarche is a rebuttal spot? As the onset of menarche happens, the epiphyseal fusion takes place and hence there is no role of injection growth hormone in this child. This is a child which I recently also saw. This child has was always short. He was changing his shoe size in two to three years where we know that every school going child has a change in shoe size every year. They also thought that maybe because the mother is short, so the child is short and hence may not require any medical attention. And they also felt that eventually when the puberty will, will come in, the child will grow taller. So was it correct to wait? Definitely it was not correct to wait. It was important that it got evaluated and if it was normal to observe for further assessment. The third one, uh, we are short parents. So if there is a familial short stature, we can only help with growth hormone if one of those parents were growth hormone deficiency and hence we have an erroneous midparental height. But a familial short stature will follow the trend of the midparental height and in spite of doing everything, they will still have a good growth velocity and good bone age. Hence, the growth hormone will not help them because growth hormone is actually a replacement. It will not help in this child who is growing normally and doing otherwise well. But definitely, if one of those parents were not evaluated in childhood and they had a problem, then this child will benefit. Now, this is a fourth scenario where the child was growing okay, but had something went wrong with the onset of puberty because the other children achieved pubertal spurt and they, they outgrew the, this child. 
so when we dig into the history we found that the father had a delayed onset of puberty so this is probably constitutional delay of growth and puberty so there may not be any problem but we need to keep a close watch on this child to see whether the child is achieving his uh, normal onset of puberty if not then we are looking at something which which is related to hypogonadism and the last scenario my son is 16 years and we believe that everyone grows till 18 years so can we give him injection growth hormone so no he's already started shaving so he's achieved his pubertal spurt he's been doing that he's been shaving on a regular interval so probably his epiphysis would have fused so definitely there will be no growth of uh, no role of uh, growth hormone injection in this child so the key message to this whole session was it's important that we monitor growth parameters either we teach the uh, teach the parents or we do it ourselves we need to plot them on the growth charts to know whether there is any problem with this child because it will help to evaluate the disorders early either we can do it physically on a growth chart or on an app based program so that we don't miss out these children and we can help these children earlier as we know that once the children goes towards puberty we have less time and we may not be able to do justice to their growth endocrine causes of short stature are very uh, are not common hence it's always important to look at nourishment and uh, chronic systemic illness rule them out before you do any hormonal investigations and never include a single baseline growth hormone level in your investigation chart because it will never be helpful as growth hormone has its own trough and peaks and hence a single baseline growth hormone level will not point to any of the diagnosis thank you thank you dr ruchi that was a exhaustive and wonderful talk and uh, hopefully now uh, everyone has uh, understood more about growth and stature Uh, well as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon it's really important to us because we know growth uh, it does not uh, it's not just cosmetic it has a lot of uh, psychological and social issues hence a lot of families come to us for lengthening and other things as such so uh, basically uh, my uh, i'll ask a few questions before we get on to the audience one is uh, can you tell us like are there some red flags or some small signs that either the parents or our family physicians uh, family physicians can pick up early so that these children reach you in an appropriate time uh, where they can be treated properly yes so very important that as you said that they should reach out to us at an appropriate time for an appropriate and you know beneficial treatment so it's important that uh, one is the parents themselves can monitor because obviously they every year the school monitors their growth okay and there are parents who always monitor their child children you will have the walls all filled with you know growth patterns so what if it is not adequate we can as we said we can always look at a growth trend so if they see that the growth trend is not not helpful definitely they can reach out to the uh, the physician or the pediatrician also as we know that there is a growth app available so if they come to the if to the physicians or pediatricians they should be enlightened about that they should download it and they should start you know putting out the points over there so they can see for themselves how the child is doing so this will be when they are monitoring but yes if the child is looking sick if they find that the child is having sickness which is related to any system or if there is any problem associated with the growth like developmental milestone so there could be hypothyroidism in this child coming to the orthopedic part you know rickets so we know that the the rickets which is nutritional the correction may take up to 1 to 2 years of the bones but if it's not corrected then definitely we should reach out to you because mod remodeling and lengthening will will be beneficial to them not that every rickets requires orthopedic intervention but after we waited for a certain period of time and if this if this was just nutritional and not looking at any other problems then definitely we can take help of even the orthopedician besides the endocrinologist so important to always ask very quickly how the child is doing because scholastic backwardness is also one of the problems like like i said psychosocial so we don't know if there was any problem with the learning or with you know with the social environment so we should not ignore the mental health which can also affect growth thank you and uh, as such i mean for most uh, syndromic or other pathologies they are they are quite easy to pick up but for the other part, uh, other field where they are not so easy to pick up and these children look pretty much normal but they do have issues uh, is there uh, is there something like a uh, ideal time period where they should see you or is a certain age too late before they see you yeah so uh, exactly so where i mean obviously you saw the syndromic and the endocrine causes you know where we could have some clinical signs to pick up 
but there could be some like you know the the clinical case that i showed a celiac they may not show any any clinical sign it's just the weight which which we plotted the height and as you saw that it was at 10 years it got detected but it was way beyond you know 3 and 4 years where the child was getting affected so this will not probably affect the quality of life but you know we forget that height is also a quality of life so this growth parameters assessment should start right from birth as i said immunization contact should not be missed out it is very important and sga child so a child who's born low birth weight birth weight at term we can help them if they have not caught up to the peer appropriate height at as early as 4 years of age so if we wait till about 10 years 12 years first we have wait, waited too long and we wasted that time now we are left we are left with very short period of time here we are also looking at growth and puberty so when do we then start the puberty do we stop their puberty because we want to give them growth so we should be making sure that they are sent at an appropriate time so they get enough time for growth and they are given an onset of puberty also on time because delayed onset will again have a psychosocial problem on the child Uh, thank you uh, we have dr nagwekar who is asking us uh, uh, is there any simple way of uh, assessing bone age in day to day uh, family physician practice yeah so uh, basically uh, bone age is is best read by the person who has the most experience so that's one two is bone age has an app where you can actually calculate all the bones and then feed in so one who has an experience will probably do this in 20 minutes and one without experience will do it in one hour in one hour so i would say a radiologist who has an experience or an endocrinologist who has an experience would be the best to judge a bone age otherwise bone age is very difficult and definitely number of carpal bones minus 2 is not the way you evaluate the bone age it is actually looking at the quality of bone so when the bones appear how they grow how they fuse is what is important so um, with experience if you have if you if you are experienced and you have an interest in pediatric endocrinology and if you've seen uh, more than 100 x-rays then obviously you have atlas as a pdf which you can download and you can always compare with that but remember these atlas are all based on caucasian reference ranges so you know we will only look at something which is beyond 18 months to 2 years of a chronological chronological age where we will say it is abnormal but 6 months here and there we are not looking at an appropriate reference range soon i guess we'll also have an indian reference uh, bone age uh, coming out so no not very easy to have it in our day to day practice if at all our family physicians are sending for a radiologist to i mean get the bone age for them is there a specific method or something that you would advise which will give them a more accurate answer yes. instead of something else yeah I, i'm sure most of these uh, most of the uh, physicians must have seen that the bone age is reported as anywhere between 9 to 18 years i think that even we can do it without a bone age so that does not help us at all so that means no reference was taken for that it was just judged by looking at the appearance and all so tanner white house is the best way of comparing uh, the bone age and a radiologist should have an easy access to the stanner white house 2 app which can help us to know what is the skeletal maturation or the bone age uh, thank you uh, then uh, dr uh, manglik basically wants a clarification is uh, where you spoke about growth hormone treatment so he wants to know that uh, does it help only if there is a deficiency or uh, can you still uh, use it or not yes so growth hormone was uh, uh, initially developed only for replacement of growth hormone deficiency but eventually it has got approved for children who are small for gestational age these are 10% of the people who don't catch up to the peer peer is your 50th percentile is what we were talking about or the age appropriate catch up so these children after 4 years of age can had a have an advantage of growth hormone even though they are not growth hormone deficiency syndromes turner syndrome nunan syndrome these are the two syndromes which have been approved for growth hormone in turner syndrome if the child, if the girl is missed they can miss their height by almost 20 cm and obviously they will not even have an onset of puberty so nunan and turner syndrome can have an advantage of growth hormone even in acquired causes of growth hormone deficiency like trauma irradiation you know tumor so once the child is in remission so remission after one or two years and when, when there is a problem with growth 
hormone you can safely give growth hormone even though we know that one of the side effects of growth hormone is second cancer but we have yet to know whether it can cause that problem because sometimes it is the it is actually the etiology and pathophysiology of the tumor to recur and may not be because of the growth hormone and also idiopathic short stature where we don't have any idea but the child is still growing short we can always give them an advantage of uh, of growth hormone because that will definitely help them to grow over and above what they were growing and if started earlier if if evaluated and diagnosed earlier they will have more uh, period of time to take this growth hormone and they can probably catch up to the adult stage so yeah there are many other uh, reasons why where we can use uh, growth hormone thank you uh, adding up on the growth hormone therapy uh i know uh, i mean uh, can you just tell in brief a little bit about what are are there any long term effects of this therapy and always i mean uh, i don't know you might have been uh, this question would have come up quite often to you by parents does these uh, growth hormone therapy or these defects affect the other development like intellect or like uh, the ability to be independent and other such thing does it have any does it affect anything else in their life right so uh, yeah a very good question to know how growth hormone is useful right so obviously adverse effects any parent would ask you know what would be the adverse effect because obviously un- unfortunately everything that we have in endocrine is injectable so anything that is injectable is is supposed to be more harmful than that is oral so growth hormone as far as the way it is used why it is used who is using it and how we are using it if you are able to correctly answer and identify this then growth hormone is very safe but if you are using it for just cosmetic reason then definitely it is unsafe what we see in growth hormone is because the child is chronically not growing well so when we initiate growth hormone they could have benign intracranial hypertension so we always start with a very small amount and then we increase it gradually so that the body gets adapted now if we are uh, giving the growth hormone in an unknown cause what happens is it does affect the bones right because it's the growth of the entire body so it's the entire body who has to catch up with the height so if the if the growth hormone is not given in an appropriate manner and there is no assessment then it can cause scoliosis or slipped capital femoral epiphysis though it's not very common that we see this okay and the next that we we see is uh, there could be a hyperglycemia induced by growth hormone which is completely reversed once the growth hormone is stopped and the last is the second tumor so uh, the there is always this worry about second tumor when we are using growth hormone in in a in a children who have achieved remission post cancer but uh, as we said it's more theoretical we don't have enough data to disprove the use of growth hormone in this children so yes it is important just not when you initiate is also important how you follow up this children it's not that once you give the growth hormone they are lost to follow up because even after that they can they can have so the long term problems with the with the child on growth hormone could be bone related problems that's your scoliosis and your slipped capital femoral epiphysis so we always use clinical parameters and a therapeutic uh, dosage where we know where we need to titrate and make sure that this child don't does not have any problems with growth hormone thank you uh, we have another question from the audience uh, they say how much uh, significance does physical activity and exercise play in uh, growth and like from you might uh, parents must be asking you what yes. can they do will certain exercise help their child's growth yeah in fact uh, the parents i would just take it in a in a common case scenario it just hits to them at puberty that now my child is not growing to grow so they will just put up a bar they will put the child in a, in you know in in some uh, in some sports activity in swimming classes so they want to make sure that the child achieves everything so we said growth is a predetermined factor of health so for health physical activity is at most important so yes physical activity at every point in time is important it's not like the physical activity is going to increase your growth beyond what you're going to achieve but it will help to optimize what you have to achieve if your physical activity is less and then you suddenly in one year you want that the physical activity is going to make you achieve a height of amitabh bachchan that's not going to happen so the physical activity has to be an ongoing process as nutrition is so both are ongoing process nothing can happen at you know at a later stage or a very short period of time so yes for health and for growth physical activity is important lovely thank you so much uh, we have another question from dr bhagat she is uh, uh, given you a scenario like can uh, in a same family can you have uh, two children one with uh, constitutional delay and the other with uh, familial short stature is it possible so yeah i mean uh, it's 
it's not very common to have both the scenarios in in a child but obviously we saw this clear case uh, scenario where the parents like the mother was shot and the father had a delayed onset of puberty but the child actually had a systemic problem so yes uh, there the we we usually say that the constitutional delay of growth and puberty we see it more in boys than in girls okay and this is uh, this we only see it uh, we usually see it when there is a family history that is there but if these parents were shot and also had delayed onset of growth and puberty one of these uh, scenario could be there in these children but it is not 100% so but a familial short stature would definitely grow up to that uh, uh, you know target height of the family but yes it's important that this was only constitutional delay in one of the parents and there was no other problem which was not evaluated and we are just taking this child for granted all right uh thank you so much so uh that's all the questions from the audience does anyone have i uh, want to ask anything or uh, any any uh, still any more questions um i think uh, that's it from the audience just uh, before we end i'll ask a last question i know there are um, million reasons for uh, stature and there are hundreds and thousands of disorders and there are even more number of blood tests so uh, as such uh, what would be your advice because these families end up spending a lot on these expensive blood tests is there something you would recommend as a basic panel which a family physician or someone should do or they should not do anything and leave it to a expert if possible sure so yes i mean i know that uh, that list of even level 1 was too elaborated and every family would not be able to do it but that we are doing it only if we don't find anything on history and examination so again in, in any pediatric case history examination birth history family history plays a very important role so if you pick up some some points from your present history from your family history you may just do a very focused test in the child but if you don't have any prob you don't find any clinical signs in them then before sending out to you know any specialist like us or any you know looking out for any systemic the basic that we can look is look for any kidney problem liver problem nutrition that is cbc okay and look for any infection which has been there for the longest time okay and at the most a bone age which will help us whether this is an ongoing chronic illness which has affected the skeletal maturation okay but don't forget that not having a uh, bowel uh, problems may not lead to celiac so celiac in you know if we are if you are coming from a northern region i think in that first level i would definitely in, uh, include the celiac screening karyotype it's not necessary that you do it in every girl but if you find this girl way below the chart and uh, you know mid parental height then you may do a karyotype but you can just leave it to the main system that we see which is you know you can you can auscult it and, and find out whether the heart is okay you know from 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 the examination and the history the respiratory system is okay you you will be able to find out from a common test uh, whether there is any ongoing chronic illness so maybe you don't need very elaborated test when you have from a clinical uh, uh, view point but if it is if you don't have anything then these are the rare bare minimum tests that you do it and if you don't find anything then definitely uh, you know this could be a idiopathic short stature or some some form of growth hormone uh, deficiency which is partial then you can send out to the uh, specialist thank you thank you so much for your lovely talk and answering all the questions uh, so if there are no more uh, questions i'd just like to thank everyone for joining and i'd also like to thank all the uh, speakers today for a lovely talk and uh, having a lovely discussion and answering all the questions uh, i'll just uh, go back to uh, rasik sir if he wants to say a few words before we close Uh, it was an excellent uh, program and we thank all the delegates uh, who have participated today this lectures will be available on youtube for those who have missed out uh, either complete or part of it uh, uh, the next master class will be on november 11 uh, 2020 it will be again on wednesday 230 to 530 and uh, we will have three speakers uh, on that day uh first is watery eyes by dr uh, shah then uh, how to calculate doses or dosage of medicine in children by dr bharat parmar and uh, spinal deformity by uh, management of spinal deformity by dr akhil tawri so again once again i thank you all on behalf of srcc children's hospital we look forward to have you again on uh, wednesday november 11 2020 thank you
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in today. You can stop uh, YouTube streaming and recording and call off the meeting. Thank you.